Thank you, Gaspar. I hope I'm audible to everybody. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Good yes, evening. You are. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all, warm welcome to everyone. Good evening, everyone. And uh, I'm your host for today, Elizabeth. Welcome to the launch of uh, English and Marathi editions of How Con and Army Con. Um, I may remind you that this is a record. Uh, this is an online recorded event. All your queries and questions will also be recorded. So I request all participants to put off their microphones and videos at all times, except while speaking. So let me just uh, uh, run you through the program for the day. Uh, we have a welcome address by Father Anthony da Silva, followed by a screening of a video of Professor Alito. We have uh, uh, three speakers. Our keynote address uh, will be uh, given by Professor Alexander Hen, uh, followed by Ms. Favita Dias, who will give us the book description followed by a talk by Vishram Gupte. And finally, Professor Kyoko Matsukawa will speak with us. Uh, after this, we will have the publisher space where they will say a few words. And uh, finally, the floor will be open for speaking. So if you have any queries and questions, you can post them on the chat box or you can raise your hand. We will take up your questions one by one. So, uh, so, uh, so yeah, uh, let's... Um, begin but before before i start i would like to say a few words uh, on this event as this is the commemoration of professor alito and he was my professor too so uh, i would like to say something on the uh, on the title of this event that is alito the story lives on yes definitely i feel uh, so close to this that yes uh, the story lives on because of so many of you who have made time to be over here today to cherish and take forward what he left behind i i i feel so happy to see so many of you over here thank you for coming it's so good to see all of you um as a matter of fact uh, most people make investments in capital markets in share markets in land but our beloved professor he invested in minds in people and his own students he had this you know particular way of believing in somebody which was uh, so powerful and uh, so uh, so you know uh, transforming uh, though he is not with us here i'm sure that there are so many more Alitorians out there who we hope will carry this torch of uh, perspective and uh, a critical approach in education or in life in general. So uh, with these few words, I now invite Father Anthony De Silva. Uh, he needs no introduction. He is the director of the Xavier Center of Historical Research, and he has also provided us with this platform to hold the launch. And we are immensely grateful to you, Father. So uh, I invite Father Anthony to say a few words. Father Anthony, you can unmute and speak. Thank you very much. And good evening to all of you. Father, please unmute yes. and can speak. You hear? Uh, now we can hear, yes. OK. So thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, I, too, like to welcome this gathering this evening. 
uh, to the program and also to XCHR, which is a familiar institution, I think, to most of you. I am delighted that the Xavier Center of Historical Research has been invited to partner Hong Korn, the team, at this memorial event, saluting and celebrating the person and the achievements of Dr. Alito Sequeira. The poster accompanying the announcement of this event has a lovely photograph of Dr. Alito. The inquiring eyes and the gently skeptical smile portray well the heart and mind of Professor Alito. It is his listening heart and searching mind that attracted young students to Alito. Today, they are inspired to prepare this memorial program in his honor. Alito was always a friend of Xavier Center and directed his students to make use of the rich resources at our center. We hope his students now in academic or professional jobs will continue to maintain this intellectual linkage with Xavier Center and the community of scholars in Goa. You are always welcome to the center to further your study or research in the tradition of Dr. Alito. Let us keep the memory of Alito alive by doing what he did best, namely by listening and learning about our inner self and sharing the experience with others in society. Thus, the story lives on. Thank you very much and have a nice evening. Thank you, Father, for those kind words. Uh, we now have a small clip of Professor Alito uh, to show you. So please sit back and let us reminisce these moments. Gasper, are you presenting the screen? Myths and Stories, Organized Society. Myths tell you whom you can marry, whom you can't. Myths tell you when one should plant or sow and when one should reap. Myths, in that sense, help organize society and make what it is. There are stories that tell you of a, how our society originated and a whole cosmology of that society is given by its myths or stories. In this sense, myths and stories are foundational. While they answer universal question, each community has its own way of presenting this. Actually, in the sense, your question is not very fair. What are you looking for when you say what's different? It's like saying Laila Majino is different from, of course, it's different from uh, Shakespeare. Isn't it? So what are you asking me saying what's peculiar to Laila Majino? It's set in India. So wrong question, BBC. <laughs> wrong question, your own news. What makes these? These as opposed to which ones? The ones that we are talking about. What's fascinating? These are basically alternative knowledge systems. They are different ways in which we come to know the world. Okay. With the community undergoing transition. And like in many other communities, there is certain stigma attached to these communities, tribal communities. And so the younger people tend to neglect this knowledge system. 
What does the project try to do? The project tries to do two things at least. One is to conserve. And the other is to reinvent the stories to give them a contemporary use. At least this is the way I understand the project. This is not the first time these songs are being collected. They have been collected by people from other communities with the purpose of recording them for texts. More recently, over the last three or four years, there are people from within the community who have also started recording and transcribing them. And their attitude is very much to positively value this, to reverse value the humiliation that this community has experienced by bringing out these in the form of books and things. It's still a small section, but nevertheless it's there. One distinction of this project, it tries to find a meaning for these stories within the community itself. In the sense that, you see, the, the capacity, our capacity to change depends on our capacity to tell a different story. I must be able to imagine a different future. I must have a different story. So that the current generation of young people can begin to reimagine themselves differently without having to deny their past, then that would be a way in which they continue to transform the myths for a contemporary uh, purpose. And this is something uh, that we would all like to see through this project. Now, thanks to writing, which has its own uh, enormous advantages in which to, uh, stories can be read across time and across place. But this universalizing of the story loses also an important feature of the oral. The oral is extremely dynamic. No story can be told twice in the same way. Even the same person telling the story makes some change, some nuance, some feeling, some gesture that is different from the one that was earlier. Now you take all these little bits of differences and you multiply them over thousands of people telling the story over five generations. You have an enormous variety. Things get dropped, new things emerge. So one of Vitae's thing is also to demonstrate how even across two villages, the story has lost something and gained something. So this dynamic character of the oral tradition is something we need to look at and how we can, how we can, I don't know how, to, the word is probably not revive, but how to uh, in, bring it into our contemporary culture. And we hope that there are other things that will come from this project. Basically, an interest and in revival of looking at this particular section of Goan society, which has been discriminated as tribal in the past, and to bring on board their knowledge system, their uh, uh, cosmology, their stories of origin. One of the interesting things is about the project. It works in the, it works, it, it's a sort of, what you say, it works at the intersection of three or four domains. One is conservation of intangible heritage. The other is social justice, trying to redress the asymmetries in the knowledge system by which tribal knowledges have been diminished. Third, pedagogy. The role that learning has to play 
in trying to absorb different knowledges of communities that have been excluded. And fourth, cultural politics. That is, the stories of culture have to be articulated, voiced and heard if the community is to get a voice in us yeah, and a mandate to live its own distinct life. Yeah. I give an example in music. Uh, you probably have heard of how we have retro and fusion where you take old songs and jazz them up to a modern idiom. I'm sure I'm almost confident uh, a decade or two or three uh, from now there will be people from this community using their myths and rewriting the ends, using characters from these myths, creatively mixing them with contemporary characters. So at once evoking the past, but also projecting towards the future. I don't know, think about it. Think about it. Do you need to tell this philosophy in the end or is it obvious from the story? Huh? You think about it. Thank you, Gasper, for showing us this video. It surely brought back a lot of memories for all of us, I'm sure. Um, uh, this uh, video actually was, uh, uh, it's a collection of clips from an interview um, that uh, Al uh, Sir Elito had done for a future for Euro News. Uh, it was, he was doing it on the, on the, it was a project on myths and stories in culture, in cultures. And uh, this feature at the time, at that time, was aired across Europe on the Euro News Network in 2014. Um, so with this, uh, I, I want to move forward. And without wasting more time, I, call, I want to call <coughs> our keynote speaker of the event, Professor Alexander Hen. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for being with us here. Professor Alexander is a professor of religious studies of Arizona University, Phoenix, USA. He received his uh, doctorate in 1988 from Mainz University, Germany. Currently, he works on the history and ethnography of Indo-European encounter and theory of ritual and religion. He was also assistant and adjunct professor of anthropology and universities of Heidelberg and Mainz. He has also served as visiting professor of Delhi University and Goa University. Among his publications uh, mm -hmm. about Goa are Hindu Catholic Encounter in Goa, Religion, Colonialism and Modernity, that was in 2015, and uh, two other ar articles published in the journal Samaj, which was relating to Goa. Shrines of Goa, Iconographic Formation and Popular Appeal, published in 2018, and Krista Purana, translating the name of Goa in early modern Goa, uh, published in 2015. Thank you. Now I call upon uh, Professor Alexander to deliver the keynote address. Professor Thank you. Jimé, yeah. Yeah, yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, let me first make sure, can you all see and hear me? Yes. Yes, yes we yes. can. Yeah. Hi, let me adjust my screen a little bit here. Yes. Okay. Um, dear audience, dear students, colleagues, and friends, um, it gives me great pleasure to speak before you today. and. Uh, let me add also that I'm talking to you currently from Heidelberg, Germany. It gives me great pleasure to celebrate with you the splendid collaboration of students, editors and designers working together to make possible the launch and release of this 
book on Khan, who am I? It also gives me great pleasure to recall and remember the legacy of the brilliant mind and man behind this project. That is the late Alito Siquera, whom we all miss so much. I think Aung Khan is not only an important book because it speaks about problems that students coming from tribal populations and students from uh, rural areas have with Goa's higher education. Aung Khan is also an innovative book because it addresses these problems in an unconventional and novel way. Quite obviously, this book emerges from a pedagogical concern that does not let itself be satisfied by political decision and uh, legal policies alone. Aung Khan makes clear that uh, reservation policies regulating the access to higher education for ST and OBC populations do not suffice to resolve Goa's educational problem. Instead, what it shows is that what is needed are radical pedagogical reforms, reforms that practically and methodologically safeguard that students can benefit from their education. To put this in Alito Siquera's own words, to give somebody the right to speak is not yet the same as to give somebody a voice. In other words, Aung Khan is a book that makes it so clear that it is so much more complex, that it takes so much more effort, intellect, engagement, and courage to give students a voice, to give students their voice. In this sense, Aung Khan, chapter by chapter, speaks about, reveals, criticizes, and overcomes conditions that impact, obstruct, and impede that students, and especially students from subaltern communities, can find their voices. Literally, all chapters of the book deal with circumstances illustrating what it means to belong to Goa's indigenous population or to come from one of Goa's marginalized castes. Gaude, Velip, Kunbi, Karvi, and other tribal and marginalized caste communities from Goa and from outside Goa are, and that is the important thing, the subject and the agents of this book. That is what makes it novel and innovative. The chapters of the book also critically reflect what it means to be a woman and what it means to come from Goa's rural areas. So, to speak about the student contributors, Cheryl de Sousa records the ambiguous role of Gaudi women performing traditional dances in modern tourist contexts. Nine out of 10 chapters of the book are written by women. And the only one male contributor, Sashin Savio Moraes, critically analyzes the social impact that temporary male labor migration has for the female members of their families. Old, modern, and changing situations in Goa's Gao the villages and rural areas is another important topic of the book. Venetia Fernandez lets the reader take part in the bittersweet ethnography of the local memories of Kurdi, the village in Sanguem Taluka that in 1986 was immersed into the artificial lake created by the Selaulim Dam. Mosinia Fernandez critically asks what modernization 
and caste discrimination does to the remembering and forgetting of the mand, that is, the songs and rituals of Catholic Gaudi, Kunbi, and Karvi villages in the old conquest. Priti Padgonkar reveals the ambiguous nature of old social norms by sharing with us what it means to be a villager, yet not a gaunkar of a traditional Goan village. Religious traditions, we learn, may also be a mixed blessing to the emerging identities of female students from subaltern communities. Rajeshwari Meshta vividly describes how Sabha, a, a new age Christian religious movement, has influenced her life and self-understanding as a young woman from a migrant fishing community living in Vasco da Gama. Kushpunarangi finally presents an interesting interview-based study how religious traditions coupled with traditional gender role expectations influences decisions and chances of higher education for young women in Goa's Muslim community. Two theoretical issues stand out critically in the book. One is what technical academic jargon calls intersectionality. Marginalization, we learn, is produced in many layers. It has many layers. Social disadvantages are mounting one over the other. Chances of finding one's voice in higher education as a member of a tribal community are aggravated by obsolete gender norms that discriminate against women. Being identified with a marginalized caste makes things worse, as does coming from a village or rural area or coming from outside of Goa as a migrant. Religious customs and obsolete traditional norms add to the mix that produces social marginalization. Intriguingly, however, the book also evidences that academic procedures and educational institutions do not mediate, but further complicate the life and learning of subaltern students. Academic types of learning and institutional norms of speaking hinder rather than help the students. It is here that Alito Sequeira's emphatic and creative mind and method as a teacher came to its best. Alito did not harrow his students with the learning and repeating of what he called declarative knowledge. Alito encouraged enabled and empowered his students to create knowledge about themselves, their social circumstances, biographies, histories, and lives. Learning in higher education, Alito Sequeira emphasizes, must be a process of self-discovery and self-recovery. Along these lines, Alito also recognized that the medium of teaching and learning is the most critical of all. Without dismissing education and expression in international and national languages, English, Hindi, Urdu, Portuguese, Alito's pedagogy recognized the indispensable value and empowering intelligence lying in one's mother tongue and in local vernaculars such as Konkani. Not only did Alito therefore encourage his student, Avita Gonsalves, to study the embarrassing shame and detrimental denial that young people and students feel when speaking Konkani in their daily life and professional practice, which made it into another chapter of the book. Together with the help of experts, filmmakers, translators, artists, and editors, Alito also developed a pedagogy and form of learning that was multilingual and multimodal. 
He allowed his students to mix English, Konkani, and other languages and vernaculars in their writings. Students were also permitted to leave the grammarly and literary standards of normative language use and were encouraged to experiment with hybrid, poetic, non-standard writing styles. Successful and famous, even beyond the university classroom, and you all know that, became Alito's workshops for digital storytelling. Here, students learned to draft and craft personal stories and reflections with basic di digital technologies, video filming, sound recording, photograph sampling. Alito wanted his students to combine sophisticated academic reflection with innovative and creative technology, and above all, with authentic personal concerns and questions. Aung Khan, who am I? asks Priyanka Vilip, one of his pioneer students in her magisterial work. Priyanka asks this question in an academic setting, which, as she cogently illustrates in her chapter, was and is itself actively involved in the silencing, or as she calls it, in the othering of the Vilip social community she belongs to. Intriguingly, Priyanka, Priyanka's question thus does, does primarily not produce an answer, but reveals the existence of an ignorance, the existence of a silence in the academic institution about her social group. It belongs to Alito's distinct authenticity that he encouraged his students to raise questions for which the academic institution he himself belonged to did not have quick answers. Aung Khan is therefore not only an important and an innovative book, Aung Khan is also a courageous book. It breathes the spirit and atmosphere of a classroom made by a wise and fearless teacher and a group of spirited and creative students. So I want to I wanna conclude but with my congratulations and best wishes for this fabulous publication to all its, of its facilitators. First of all, of course, the students who wrote the chapters and made this possible. And then also Favita Diaz at um, uh, Goa University uh, Department of, Social, uh, of Sociology. And then of course, to the entire, to the entire group of uh, Goan professionals whose name I cannot spell out individually here, who all helped together to make this possible. The filmmakers, publishers, copy editors, translators, lawyers, artists, and designers who all collaborated to make this possible in the memory of Alito Sequeira. I hope and I wish that the project of Aung Khan may still live on, as the, as the little clip said right now, and will not end here, but will only be the beginning in Goa's higher education and in the public to pursue the program of teaching and learning that Alito described as leading to self-discovery and self-recovery. I can see that such a program can well thrive in the world of the global south and beyond, resonating with the call for social justice, critical caste, race, and gender studies, and the impact of indigenous and subaltern knowledge into the problems of the world. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor, uh, for sharing your thoughts about Professor Alito and the book. Um, now I call upon Favita Dias to uh, give us the description of the book. Favita Dias is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology, Goa University. Favita? Hi. Uh, am, I, am I audible? Yes. Yes. 
uh, I think Professor Han has in detail already, uh, you know, spoken about the book, and uh, I will be just adding to like from my uh, view what how I see this book as and the relevance of it, especially in the Goan society. So I came across this uh, Hong Kong uh, as like a you know, small. Um, kind of a pamphlet which had you know abstracts of all the uh, papers that are there in the book and I'm, I think Liz you were also with me at that time it was in 2011 when there was this international seminar that was organized uh, at the Goa University and we were students at that time so I remember this idea sir was you know putting across uh, to the international audience at that time and it took such a long time for this book to finally uh, you know get published and i feel very um, you know honored and you know privileged to be closely associated with this book so uh, uh, as professor han has already spoken about what these 10 stories are about i see these 10 stories as you know being very unique in their own ways and also touches upon different aspects of the Goan society itself. So I think this is something that Professor Alito, uh, like Sir Alito always tried to do in our classroom, you know. So before going to the whole society, it would be about your own self, you know, your own life. So he would make you look into that part of your life which you would always avoid looking at, you know, because it brings about a lot of uncomfortability, uh, you know, pain, and you know, you don't want to remember those stories or that particular idea and I think towards the end of the clip that was the digital storytelling thing uh, wherein you know we had we were given just five minutes to think about something that changed your life you know that's how you would start and I think these dissertations including my own which is not in this book <laughs> you know was uh, started like this you know you write about something that has changed your life or something that you cannot remember and that's how these things started so all these stories not only touch upon the different aspect of the Goan society but also touch upon different aspects of our own lives and when I read just the abstracts I could connect to uh, you know um, oh, sorry there's something popped up Sorry, sorry. Uh, so uh, you know, so uh, so I just read the abstracts at that time, and I could connect to different things that these different women were saying, you know, about their own lives, about the pain, the discrimination that they face, and somewhere it also made me accept the different uh, pains and you know the discriminations that I faced and you know talk about these things about especially about my tribal identity which I've been always hiding you know and so it was for me like if they can speak about it then you know why, why can't I it was just after reading the abstract so the power that these stories have is something that you know needs to be brought out you know so and I'm I'm very sure that when people read these uh, stories, they will be able to connect to uh, you know, or they will have at least some similar experiences. So I see this book not only as you know collection of stories that were uh, you know uh, one's uh, dissertations and you know something. I see this book as breaking or you know something that is completely unconventional. You know and. Uh, setting up new standards within academics you know we have some standardized uh, you know uh, thought about what academic is so that is something I see this book as you know uh, trying to challenge it for mainly because first of all uh, how these stories have come about you know how they have been written who have written them what they speak about and in the classroom even now you're not expected to or you're at least uh, you know you you don't talk about your personal lives you know because these things are something that are not to be discussed within the classroom they're taken for granted and you know that's i think that is something uh, sir alito also tried to do that taking the granted and showing that it is not not something that is to be taken for granted you know you can you can do tons of things with these uh, th uh, with that one small thing that is taken as granted for so i see this book as uh, you know something a space that is being provided wherein you know you can put out your uh, you know
emotions your feelings and you know your pain and hurt and when you read them you know you 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 feel that you're not alone that is something these stories do you know they touch you they have this power they may not like you know <laughs> they, they may not be able to heal all the pain that you're going through but it will make you feel that okay you're not the only one who's going through and i think it has created a kind of a space now we're discussing all these stories you know these stories have uh, been given value you know like how sir would say reverse value the discrimination you know and find value within these stories for our own selves and then we, when we start discussing these things it gets academic value as well and stories are considered to be or anything i feel at least uh, in the education sector it gets uh, value once it is brought within the classroom there is some discussion around it so i think this books has that capacity that has you know brought these kinds of ideas within the classroom in goa at least and i hope that these uh, this kind of book is being discussed more and more within the classroom and such more stories come out and you know more experiences so it brings out a completely different side of goan society wherein we see goa as a very liberal space you know as a, you know a very equal equal equitarian society uh, a place where uh, you know it's a tourist destination but there is also another side of goa which i feel this book brings about and um, i feel uh, that we we could have even more you know such stories coming up but only when we have this book being circulated and read enough among the goan population as well so thank you and i wish all of us all the best thank you favi uh, for sharing your thoughts uh, our next speaker is a marathi novelist critic and a bilingual translator he has taught philosophy in two local colleges in goa and was also associated with sangat the goa's mental health ngo so let's please welcome uh, vishram gupte to say a few words hello and good evening everyone hello sir this is a great uh, occasion for me personally being alito's very close friend uh, i was destined to translate i would say his magnum opus into marathi i have called it me kon since this book occupied me for about 8 to 9 months i was quite full of it i was obsessed with this book i used to discuss this with my wife sheila so i am going to discuss i am going to tell you the process of translation in one way then i would also give a very brief picture of this book which i have registered and then very briefly i would talk about my association with alito my my relationship with him and what i earned what i got from him and what i gave but before that i would uh, since it is a marathi book i would speak two words in marathi mi kon he pustak mala mhanje mi kadambarya likto ani mala asa ti ek 10 kadambaryancha kathanak aslela ek mala masala milala tacha mhanje युजली प्रश्न विचार जो कि मी को मग तू ब्रह्म हैस कि तो ईश्वरा अवतार हैस कि तो ईश्वर हैस अगित जो पलित पुस्तका मधे मी को एक सामाजिक दृष्टिया सांस्कृतिक दृष्टिया एक खोल असा शोध घो दहा वेगवेग् विद्यार्थ्यामार्फत त्यामुळे त्या शोधाच स्वरूप असं आहे की ते त्याला दहा दिशा असतात असं एक कथानक आपण म्हणूया असं ते कथानक आहे आणि त्याचं खूपच महत्व आहे असं मला वाटतं 
मराठीमध्ये हे पुस्तक ज्याला आपण अनप्रेसिडेंटेड म्हणतो इंग्लिशमध्ये असं एक पुस्तक आहे की ते अतिशय रोचक आहे पण तितकंच ते गंभीर सुद्धा आहे सो मला असं वाटतं की या पुस्तकाची म्हणजे या पुस्तकाचं डिस्ट्रीब्युशन मराठीच इंग्लिश तर जगभरात जाईल पण हे मराठी पुस्तक किमान गोव्यामध्ये कॉलेजेस सोशॉलॉजी शिकणाऱ्या विद्यार्थ्यांमध्ये जर का हे पुस्तक पोहोचलं तर त्यांना स्वतःबद्दल आणि गोव्याबद्दल काहीतरी अनोखं कळेल असं मला वाटतं आणि म्हणून या पुस्तकाचं मला महत्व अपूर्व आहे असं मला सांगायचं आहे नाव आय वुड स्पीच टू इंग्लिश इट्स अ व्हेरी युनिक बुक ॲज डॉक्टर अलेक्स झंडर ॲज ऑलरेडी ब्युटिफुली सामड अप अँड कविता हॅज ॲडेड टू दॅट कमिशन दिस इज अ बुक विच रेझेस सम फंडामेंटल एक्झिस्टेन्शियलिस्ट क्वेश्चन हु एम आय and if you ask this question to say a typical indian guru he would tell you that you are a brahman or you are a supreme human being or you are somebody who is one with god or you are a seeker the alito is not someone who would buy these arguments he was a hardcore rationalist a modernist and he would want you to know your exact location your gender your caste your class your location geographical location your language all those things were very very important for alito as a teacher as a human being as a friend so i feel that with this inquiry he inspired his students to think about it this is actually a very spiritually charged question who am i but alito wanted his student to understand this question in a sociological context i would say that this is a very unique sociological and anthropological study of goan society those who have known this book those who have read this book they know what i am talking but those who have not yet read this book this book will come through as a mirror you are completely zapped by the content i i i i feel that being a being a writer writing a fiction is something which comes to me naturally but when i started translating this book into this non fiction book into marathi i was personally very enriched i felt that there are so many aspects of goan society which are new to me and then i would not go into the details of those ten narration but as a translator what did i think about each one for example there is a question like idea of nativity the first essay is about which is my native place this is a very very difficult question to some of us who have left our moorings and traveled to a different land so priti padgavkar goes in search of this question she is herself tormented and then she comes to the conclusion that nativity is something which it is not so very important to me today although she began her journey with that so i would say that this is a very philosophical question that priti approaches with her sociological insights the second essay is also very very interesting and i was actually thrilled to translate this essay 
This is about new age religion. Now, Rajeshwari Mehta has done a fabulous job by actually talking to people who have joined the sub religious groups. Very important. And then the third essay is something very close to the hearts of many of us the status of Kokni. Why, in spite of being an official language, Kokni doesn't enjoy the status, the prestige, the eminence. And uh, Avita Gonsalves has done a very, very meticulous job. She has talked to people whose mother tongue is Kokni, but who are shy of speaking Kokni in public. Now, this is very uh, familiar. Many of us know that we, we switch over to English as soon as we find, we, we feel like impressing people. So, how we forget our mother tongue and how then we become decultured. And then I would talk about a beautiful documentary. It is about Moksa Market. Cheryl D'Souza has done a fabulous job. Maksa Market is my favorite one. I usually go there. I, 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 buy, I used to buy all my things, of course, before pandemic. I used to think that I am an expert in Maksa Market. <laughs> I used to know everything. If you ask me all the traditional things, I would take you and I will take you to the exact person. But after reading and after translating Cheryl's Mopsa Market documentary, I would call it documentary, it is so visual. She talks about all those women who sell their things. It is very uh, interesting. And then Venisha Fernandez talks about Kurdi village, how it was submerged due to a dam. Now, this is a fabulous narration. This is the memories of displacement and also longing for what we have lost. In fact, her father has lost his place and she just knows from her father and then she goes with her father to that place. That place. And there is a whole lot of reminiscences and insights. While I did it into Marathi, I found that I have to go to this place. I have not yet gone, but certainly the moment I get my chance, I will visit Kurdi, maybe during this summer. And then Elizabeth, who is anchor, she is anchoring this program very competently. She has written a poetic piece, I would say. Why should we dance? And you get a completely ringside view of people who dance professionally and earn money, make a living. I would call it a creative piece, a poetic piece. And then Muthina has written about where has our folk songs gone? This is actually a full of nostalgia at one side and trying to regain, trying to recapture this thing through oral history. She talks to many people. She talks to elderly generation people. She talks to young people. And she gets their opinion. And then, as a translator, I sympathize with her, uh, I would say, narration. And then, Priyanka Welp writes about being a Welp, being a Welp person. Now, this is something she is writing back to the establishment. 
which Alito wanted all of us to do. Alito taught this particular thing to his students. There is a tradition where the mainstream discourse is framed in a particular fashion. Now, Priyanka has raised some very fundamental questions. After going through the literature about Valip, she comes to a very funny conclusion that whatever, being a Valip, I could never be, get persuaded by all those books. So, this is what a Valip is. And then she gives her interpretation. And then there is an exception, Sachin Morais. Alexander said that he is the only male narrator who is writing about this. Also, a very, very touching book, touching uh, account of what happens to the women whose husbands go on boat, make their living, send money, and how these women cope with their families, with their society, how they raise their children. Very, very moving account, very deeply touching account. And the last is written by Kushbu Narangi. Now, she is a Muslim girl coming from a Muslim background, coming from a conservative background, how she fights for her educational right and what she gets. And it's also a very inspiring account of a, a Muslim girl who, who understands her status but she wants to change it. She wants to emphasize She tells us that how education will be an answer. It's a very contemporary uh, piece which has a lot of resonance with our life. Of course, I want you to read this book and if those who can read in Marathi, I would be very happy to know from them what do they think because this is a non-fiction and also an academic book. I would call it an academic book with a lot of bibliographic references and notes. I had difficult time in actually doing all these things. So actually, I will request Marathi readers to go through this book and uh, opine about this book. Tell me whether they find it easy, whether they find it uh, theoretically difficult, whether some jargons are missing, whether I have become more informal. So that is one thing that I would expect Marathi readers to do for this book. Now, I will just briefly tell you about Alito Sekera, a friend, a friend of over more than 30 years. It's a, it's a, it's a story which, which will take hours but I will give you a very brief, brief account. If you ask me one word by which I have to describe Alito, what would that word be? I would not hesitate and say disruption. I am sure those who know Alito, they will immediately agree with this. Alito was a Archetypal disruptor. These days, there is a fashion to call somebody a disruptor. And then there are media houses which have their uh, workshops and their media interaction. They call them disruption. disruption. But Alito is the first disruptor which I saw in my life. When I came to Goa 37 years ago, when I met Alito, I could not believe that time Alito and I were both of us were in our thirties. I could not believe that such a spirit can exist. Of course, with all my writing pretensions and all those, I used to think that I am some something like very offbeat. But when I met Alito, I was attracted towards him the way iron files get attracted towards a magnet. We used to meet very frequently. We used to eat together. We used to 
to do a lot of things together. Discuss, discuss, talk. So this original disruptor taught me many things in my life. My wife and my two children, they are all very, we were very fond of Alito and he used to call us teams of India <laughs> because we were all the time, four of us were going to him and then, then we will go to some place, we will eat, then we will discuss and we will discuss things which not an average person would enjoy. It's critical discourse, basically. So, disruption is one faith which stayed with Alito throughout. He did not compromise with society. He did not compromise with systems. He always challenged systems. He always asked questions. His colleagues in university know how he rattled the establishment. He shook them. And uh, for which he is lauded and also cursed by few. The second thing that I noticed about Alito as a friend was that he was a very peculiar mixture of modernity and tradition. He would speak in a very modern jargon, but at the same time he will value all the local traditions, the rich culture that Goa possesses. He was very proud of it. And he was not just proud like ordinary man. He was a theoretician. He, he had this sense of inquiry. He would always inquire. He would always go deeper into the issue. So this is another aspect that actually touched me and also made me change my attitude. And then he was eternally interested in the problems of others. See, we have this famous us versus them and this and that. No? But he was always eager and willing to help others, irrespective of caste, class, anything. I would also say that he was somewhat like a counselor to so many of us. He was a soundboard. You go to Alito with your anxieties, you are seething with something, you go to Alito, he would make you sit, and then you wind up. He would make you say whatever you want to say. Then he would ask you pertinent questions and which would give you insight into your own self. So he was all the time interested in plumbing deeper and deeper into his own self and helping others to plumb deeper into their self. That is a very, very unique thing that I saw in Alito. In fact, I can share a secret. My third novel, that is Ishwar.com, it is actually a metaphor for Goa. And you know the protagonist, Professor D'Souza. He is actually, Alito made me think about Professor D'Souza. Those who want to know what it is. When Milan read that novel, she was laughing and laughing and laughing. And Alito was asking, what, you, what are you laughing so much? Milan knew what it is. So, in fact, Alito inspired me. He actually deeply he inspired me to see Goa, see my society in a light which I did not see before. So, there are so much that I can discuss about Alito. But I know we have limitation of time. So I would say that this Mi Kon, Mao Kon, is a book which Alito made us see our own self. Alito wanted us to, to know our own self. And through his students, he is talking to us. 
Alito with the always with us. This is the day when all of us should remember him fondly. We continue to remember him very fondly. But let me tell you that when I was translating this book, you know, translating a book requires total dedication. Every word, every word is your word. Perfectly original word. And then you come out with a proper translation. So for every page that every word, Alito was with me. And Alito is with me. He was even. Thank you very much for giving me attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Vishram, for this talk. Um, I also take the privilege to thank Mr. Suhas Sadekar and Dinesh Manekar, because of whom the Marathi version would not be possible. Thank you so much, sir. And now we move on to the next se session. We have our third speaker with us, who is a professor of cultural anthropology at the Department of Sociology, Faculty of Letters, Konan University, Japan. Uh, professor Kyoko Matsukawa will now speak to us. Yeah, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Elizabeth, uh, for introducing me. and. Uh, you know, it's my great honor to be a part of this book launch event uh, with Professor Alexander and Mr. Vishram and others. Um, I am happy to cherish the memories of the late Avito Shikwela with uh, familiar old faces uh, in this uh, challenging time of uh, COVID-19. And uh, I tell you that I'm now uh, speaking from Japan, as you know, uh, Actually, uh, Olympics games uh, over means uh, I missed, <laughs> you know, the closing ceremonies. But anyway, uh, there are lots of criticism going on about holding, uh, hosting the Olympic games in Tokyo uh, because uh, uh, the number of cases of uh, coronavirus is now uh, going up very rapidly. But anyway, uh, thank you all for making thank this you. happen. Yeah, uh, can you can you hear me? Yes, yes. It's okay. Yes. Okay, yes. I can hear you. Yeah, thank you all for making this happen, Favita, Gaspa, Sally, Rico, and others. And again, Elizabeth, thank you for hosting this event. And Avad Han Kon. Uh, Professor Alexander and Fabita and uh, Mr. Vishuram have already spoken in details. So I would like to talk about my view of how Alito developed the ideas of Hong Kong. Actually, my talk is based on a short essay which I contributed to Hong Kong book. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I can't believe that. 20 years have passed since I met Alito for the first time. At the time, uh, I was a graduate student of Osaka University, uh, the, Japanese, the Japanese University. I was seeking to conduct field work in Goa for my PhD. I became a visiting student at the Department of Sociology, Goa University. Uh, it was a uh, you know, great time that time and uh, yeah uh, i met professor alexander at that time and it was i think in december 2000 uh when i met uh, alexander all uh, right yeah uh, actually he then uh you know uh, starting to give lectures uh with alito about goan society and I also attended a series of lectures. Anito was uh, appointed as my local guide. Soon I came to realize his unique way in teaching. As you know, he often dropped bombs 
<laughs> smashed stereotypical ideas and opened students' eyes. And it ha the same happened to me. And uh, my research attempt to look into Goan society uh, was uh, in the beginning, I wanted to uh, do research on Catholic society in Goa. But later, I moved on to uh, the language issues, especially about those between Konkani and Marathi in the 1980s. Uh, that shift originated from his question. As an anthropologist, I wanted to learn local language, Konkani, and I believed that Konkani was the sole language of Goa. But it was wrong. And uh, Alito questioned me like this. Kyoko, which Konkani do you want to learn? Devanagari or Romi? I was wondering what's going on here. And uh, anyway, later I came to realize that it's true. Uh, that script issue of Devanagari Romi, uh, it was very significant in, significant in Goan society. Anyway, that idea, you know, Goan language is Konkani, it originated from my view on language as a Japanese. The query forced me to examine it. Um, I don't know. Uh, how much you know about the uh, history of Japan and Japanese language. Uh, Japan established Japanese as the sole language of the nation uh, with a particular orthography from the end of 19th century to early uh, 20th century. And I asked this to myself then, what is behind the multilingual situation in Goa and how can this be related to India as a whole and the world, including Japan? So Alito's, you know, question had <laughs> such an impact on me. You know, I'm a Japanese and uh, yeah, even I had to, you know, uh, consider about my own society. Uh, what is Japanese language and what is the history behind that? And I took, uh, you know, it took me uh, one and a half years. I stayed in Goa and I finished my uh, field work in Goa. And during that time, uh, I attended Konkani course. Uh, actually, uh, nobody has spoken in Konkani uh, in this uh, book launch yet. So <laughs> maybe I should try a little bit uh, in Konkani. Uh, Atana Mashi Konkani, you know, whistle land. How na kong guanta oitana so so grand na Konkani yeta. Funata na Konkani a practice korunga kona. Toshena Mashi Konkani Mashi. Anyway, so grand then na daiborin korumunta. And you know, this book, uh, Hong Kong, is in English and in Marathi. And I think somebody uh, asked this in a comment. And, <laughs> and as Rico uh, answered, it's, uh, you know, due to uh, global market. English is dominant and uh, Marathi is also dominant in Goa as a written language. Una, uh, Ami, Konkani uh, Uloi. And Boroi, and Shikuri. That is uh, important. You know, uh, that dominance of English uh, over the world, it should be questioned. I think that is, uh, you know, behind Alito's uh, trial attempt of this Hong Kong book. And I think uh, in the future, Alito had an idea that he should you know, uh, create a platform in Konkani language too. I, I'm really sorry that uh, he passed away uh, before, you know, he could do that. And I would like to, uh, you know, uh, show and share some uh, photos uh, with you. This is... Uh, 
I think, uh, Alexander, you remember this? Uh, we went to, uh, you know, Savoy Valley, and Alito is in front and he's smiling. It's quite rare. Oh, <laughs> and, this is uh, really nice. Gabriela yeah, is also there, you know. Oh, uh, beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I today, I, in the afternoon, I went to university office and I found this <laughs> and scanned this. And uh, this is a uh, you know, photo which was taken when I attended Konkani uh, Murao course, which was held at the Zabia, uh, no, no, Konkani, uh, Konkani Kendra. Kendra. Yeah, you remember all the fathers and Shuruti and uh, Father uh, Mashu Almeida. I, uh, you know, uh, launched, I think, a soap <laughs> magazine. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, memory I cherish. And uh, I continue my talk. It would not be that long. Uh, that time when I started uh, my career as a faculty member at uh, Nara University, after I finished my initial field work in September 2001, uh, I joined Nara University as lecturer and submitted my PhD dissertation in 2005. I felt that it was time for me to start something new, new more than just research. And I made a proposal to Alito. The project aimed to facilitate ways for people in Goa and Nara. Uh, you know, actually I work at Kona University in Kobe, but I stay in Nara. Nara is an ancient place uh, next to Kyoto and Osaka. And I wanted, uh, you know, people to discover their own society and exchange their discoveries via the internet. So, uh, you know, at the time, Alito and I had the same kind of ideas uh, to take students out of classes. I took students out in neighborhoods to learn local history by listening to people's voices. And in the course of discussion with Alito, uh, I came to be aware that Alito was struggling to come up with a new teaching method uh, to enable the students to understand sociology from their own experiences and uh, from the bottom of their heart. I remember he continually uttered, you know, about the lack of interest in texts among students in classroom. Uh, it looks like, uh, you know, students were really bored <laughs> uh, about uh, reading texts, memorizing uh, all their concepts, and they had to, uh, you know, answer in examinations. And I can understand that. And we began our project with a fund uh, by the Toyota Foundation and some collaborations in 2007, and we had workshops in Goa and Nara, you know, with the help of uh, Gaspardo Souza and uh, yeah, Ahiman Shiburte, Salir Konkal, and uh, yeah, Rafael Shrivastava. However, I could not find the right approach towards our project in the beginning. And of course, we could exchange information on our workshops, on blogs, on the net. But at the time, uh, you know, we didn't have a YouTube and we didn't have a Facebook or Instagram. And of course, there was a language barrier. Translating text between English and Japanese would take time. And who could do that? Then what to do? And I felt reaching the dead end. And one day in 2018, I think it was in June, I received an email from Alito, and he enthusiastically wrote about his discovery of data storytelling. Uh, it seems that uh, he found the website of a Center for Data Storytelling, uh, it's the, the institution in the USA, and uh, you know he actually organized data storytelling workshop with students, and with the help of Gaspar de Souza and others and there's a banner of Go Create. 
and it was an experiment in multimedia story. And uh, it was quite innovative pedagogy. And I believe that, uh, you know, many contributors of Hong Kong participated uh, in the workshops. And uh, actually it was a video produced by Ms. Pretty Padugan Kaur, uh, you know, one of the contributors of Hong Kong book. And I was really moved by the power of the narrative uh, expressed in, it was only two minute video. And she told her experience about, uh, you see, uh, her failure in the life and her relationship with her own father. And it was quite emotional. And it was a turning point for our project. And in September 2008, I arranged a study trip of a group of Japanese students to Goa. And, uh, you know, we organized a Hello Goa Nara event at the International Center of Goa. And it was followed by a short introductory workshop on digital storytelling. And I organized full digital storytelling workshop with the Japanese students after we were back in Japan and they produced their own impressive stories based on their experiences in India trip. And in the meantime, Go Create team continued to organize more digital storytelling workshops. And I also would like to share uh, actually it's a broke page of uh, you know, Gaspar de Souza. You can see some photos and uh, they were shot by uh, Gaspar. Right. And <laughs> one Japanese professor was hugging a little and, uh, you know, it was really a good, uh, you know, cultural event. Uh, because of uh, language barrier, we organized, uh, you know, some uh, unique uh, methods. Uh, you know, that photos showed that origami session and uh, I taught how to uh, use chopsticks to a student and uh, yeah, like that. And I believe that he tried to incorporate the power of storytelling and, uh, you know, self discoveries to his uh, master's students research and thesis writing. He told me about interesting and powerful dissertations that his students produced by doing research based on their own communities and experiences. I can recall that uh, it was around 2010 when he eagerly expressed his desire to compile the writings and uh, bring about a book. And of course I said, yes, this is really a good idea, great idea, you must go on and several years passed and I asked Alito about the progress of the book when I visited Goa. He replied, sorry Kyoko, my introduction is not ready yet. It was Alito. His difficulty in writing words from my point of view caused by his attempt to integrate multifaceted uh, point of views at the same time. He never feared to speak out, but he was very cautious about his writing. And I waited, waited. And when I met him at the last time in December 2017, he told me that the draft of the book was nearly ready. And I could not travel to Goa in 2018. And uh, I had not heard any news from Alito for some time. And uh, uh, actually it was uh, July 14th, 2019. And uh, I was supposed to travel to Goa in September 2019, the same year, but on August 8, I received the news that he passed away. Uh, anyway, his legacy, uh, you know, we can carry on his legacy. And uh, what he showed us, already uh, Alexander, and Vishram told us each community has their own ways of presenting. 
and stories have such power and uh, everybody's stories should be valued and university is a place to confine us to the academic ways or concepts deriving from western society as well as how to write in an academic way higher education is based on a certain knowledge producing system and uh, it looks down on local ways of knowledge production he had foresight really ahead of the age. Recently, in the fields of cultural anthropology and sociology, the methods of old ethnography are getting more attention. They allow people to reflect on their social position and presenting their stories in their own ways. I want to tell Alito that his accomplishment had the potential to be a part of the global movement of self-searching and empowerment beyond academic world. Uh, yes, though he physically left, his spirit and passion always live with us, and we will continue his legacy. Okay, thank you for your attention, and I finish my talk. Okay, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Goko, for sharing your memories and also speaking about Sir and uh, sharing with us your DST experience. Thank you so much. Um, now we move on to the publisher space. Among the publishers are Fred Frederick Narona and Dinesh ah, Manekar. Uh, I will uh, I call, will uh, call uh, you. Uh, you one by one to one speak one to with speak us and with share us and your share experience your about experience the about publishing the details, publishing details. Uh, maybe. Uh, maybe yeah so uh, so uh, uh, Frederick, Narona uh, Frederick Narona is an alternate, is publisher, an alternate and publisher and journalist. He founded Goa founded 1556. Goa 1556. Uh, uh, and um, and um, in fact, his, in fact, um, his foundation, uh, foundation it carries, uh, carries Sir uh, Alito's tagline, Alito's tagline democratizing, democratizing the production, the of, production knowledge. of knowledge. So I call upon so Frederick, call Narona Frederick Narona to say a few Narona words. Say a few words. Frederick? Hi. Frederick? Hi. Uh, Hi. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I guess you can hear me. For some reason, my camera won't come on, which is fine. Uh, I won't take too much time. I'll just uh, maybe you uh, offer four bullet points, which I want to make here. Uh, it's one of the fictions of uh, academia and of the marketplace that uh, every book needs a publisher. Well, actually, uh, you know, for those who know my publishing model, I, I am only the fictional publisher of this book because uh, don't talk to the people who worked on it because they have been undergoing a uphill struggle to get it published. And uh, the delays which Yo Koyoko talked about are also partly my responsibility. And as a result of, of, of that, uh, the book got delayed many times. Anyway, uh, as, as uh, Liz just said, uh, Alito's catchphrase, democratization, democratizing the, the, publish, the creation of knowledge is our tagline, which is not very easy to live up to at all stages. It's a, it's a tough job. Uh, and especially in a small state like Goa, in a small market, it's extremely a tough job to, uh, to deliver knowledge and to create knowledge, package it and sell it. I'm sorry to use market terms, but this is a harsh reality of, of, of the marketplace. Uh, and of course, uh, there are many, many small publishers who keep trying and after 14 years in the field, I'm quite tired. I had a lot of faith that we could uh, beat the market at its own game, but it seems to be a tough job. Uh, I think that this is not, uh, this, this uh, problem cannot be solved by charity because the market is small, but knowledge has to be produced and even small states have a right, small regions have a right, right to produce their own knowledge. So how do we go about this? Uh, it, it cannot be solved by charity. Maybe we have hints of, uh, you know, a solution in terms of what uh, Hong Kong has has delivered, where the full team works and crowdfunding, crowdsourcing has actually produced quite a good book, if I may say so myself. Alito Alito has been negotiating this book with me for a long, long time. Uh, if I put together his emails and my replies, uh, we have enough material to put together another book. <laughs> but that's that's beside the point. Uh, 
uh, I won't get into that. Uh, he, but finally, it came about. It came about quite well, and we are really happy to the team for bringing it out. It's really their credit. It's not my credit. But we need. My point I'm trying to make here is that we need alternative ways of producing and uh, creating knowledge in in a place like Goa. I will end on two personal notes, uh, two very small uh, personal reminiscences. The first one is that uh, many many people know Alito from an early stage. I know Alito from the day he was a junior lecturer. They were called lecturers then in Goa University, somewhere in 1986 or 1987. And uh, I can even remember where exactly the bus was, the blue bus was when I met him for the first time and encountered him. And we had many cups of chais, many agreements, many disagreements, many vehement disagreements, but that is part of our friendship. And that's the first point. And, and the last and the most significant point, I think, you know, Alito represents a particular phase of Goan history to me, as I understand it, because uh, he is uh, perhaps, uh, you know, the, one of the torchbearers of the early phases of the student ferment that Goa saw in the early 70s, mid 70s, uh, late 70s. And, you know, people like me represent probably in some ways on the bylines, on, on the sidelines, the last of that phase, which, which happened in the uh, late 80s or mid 80s when we still had dreams and we thought that a better society was possible. I mean, I've not given up my dreams, but <laughs> about the possibility of it is a different point. So having said that, this is both an apology to the team for doing so little because many things happened while we were working on the book and uh, it's hats off to them for bringing out this book. Thanks so much. Thank you, Frederick. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, now I call upon Dinesh Manekar. He's a column, he's a column writer. Uh, he writes uh, children's literature. He has written six books so far, and uh, I mean uh, children's literature. He's also a translator and advisor to Sanjana Publication, and so far he has published more than 150 books. Uh, so on to you, Mr. Dinesh Manekar. Hello. Hello, everybody. Yes. Hello. First of all, I am very much thankful to Mr. Uh, for the beautiful translation of the book by Vishram Gupte uh, in Marathi. And I am very much thankful to the whole team for allowing Sanjana Publications to publish the Marathi version of the book. I am of the opinion that this book should be translated in other Indian languages because the book is uh, full of uh, knowledge and uh, a very rich book. Every, every part of India needs to know about the content of the book and about uh, Professor Ali too. As far as uh, marketing of the book and the other problems of the publishers, uh, Mr. Frederick has already told, so I won't say anything, uh, but this book uh, will be available on Amazon in another two, three days or so. Uh, it will be available at Margao, uh, with confident. And if anybody wants it by post, before it is available on the stall, uh, you may please uh, WhatsApp, WhatsApp to me on my number, 955-255-1425. Immediately it will be sent to you by speed post, and we will see that the book reaches to you. The only uh, goal of a publisher, I would say, is to see that uh, all the books reaches to the readers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Dinesh, uh, for sharing these uh, details with us. Uh, now we move on to the uh, launch book launch we see uh, usually in conventional book launches we have ribbon cutting and all and now it's not possible because of the pandemic so i would request everyone who has the book with them uh, you can turn on your cameras and you can lift the book and we launch the book together uh, i think that does it sound good Yes. Yes. Those who have the Marathi versions, please lift uh, both who have both the versions. You can lift both. Mm. 
so now the book is released yeah thank you so much everyone thank you i can see your all your books uh, raised and feel so good and proud of this thing um uh, now i call upon salil chaturvedi to please read to us the preface of the book salil we can't hear you you are new to your mic i'm sorry yeah thanks liz uh the preface is uh called learning and recovery are messy and emotional by alito sequera i'm very happy to be reading alito's words this preface was written uh on the table i'm sitting on together over many meetings it was not easy to get alito to uh, fix on his writings when students sit blank faced in silence or speak or laugh loudly or look bored or are fidgety and distracted showing a lack of application or concentration they are treated as deficient in some way when they have distinct or peculiar ways of perceiving and expressing their realities they are thought to be lacking in terms of language skills innate capacities or cultural background they are treated as limited in learning and academic behaviors with no expectation of them to make any meaningful academic contribution if you have ever been one of these and which of us have not then this blog is especially for you this was written for the blog if you are one of the lucky few who was always the blue eyed student then too you may benefit from this book in this book you will see the variety of personal and cultural resources students bring to learning you will see how such deficit bearing students too can work through challenges and uncertainty anger pain and shame associated with their person or a background gender or caste or class or beauty or religion through their academic reading and writing they reinvent themselves to produce knowledge and provide us with information and perspectives on tiny bits of realities you will sometimes find yourself saying that is how i feel and have a sense of liberation at hearing someone echo your experience at other times you might realize that this is a piece of reality around you that you were not even aware of these authors show us how higher education could and perhaps should be a process of discovery and recovery from insults and hidden injuries while recreating one's identity as learners you may also see that learning is messy and an emotional affair and within quotes one cannot recover and look good at the same time close quote julia cameron you could find a clue how to do this for yourself or in your classroom and take learning forward you may even notice a hint of how these authors are challenging the conventional academic standards and redefining what could and should be higher education thank you thank you salil so much uh so now we have come to the end of uh, uh the speaking session i mean uh, all the speakers have spoken and now the floor will be open for speaking and as we have got a lot of request from uh, sir lito professor lito's close friends and associates who want to speak on this occasion uh, this uh, space will be for you all to interact Uh, also if you have any queries and questions with the uh, the speakers who have already spoken you can uh, raise your questions in the chat box we will take it up one by one and uh, if you want to ask the question in person 
you we you can put on your uh, uh, you can raise your hand then we will ask you to put on your uh, video and speak uh, please also when you write the questions in the chat ba chat box or, or any uh, comment for any of the speakers please also mention the name thank you so uh, anybody want to speak or say anything please go ahead Hi, yes. hi, thank you so much, Rico. Yes. Uh, no, no, it, uh, it, it was really wonderful to hear everybody speak. And uh, I just have only a little more to add, which is from a slightly different history of Alito. I, am, uh, I came from Bombay to Goa, and uh, Alito had a very deep connection with the neighborhood I work in very closely in Bharavi. And this is something which uh, perhaps a lot of people don't know, that he had he spent many years in a very humble neighborhood uh, and he had friends who became really his lifelong friends. And particularly Bhau Korde, I wanted to just mention about him because Bhau also lost his wife, whom Alito knew very well, uh, very recently. And on behalf of Bhau also, I would like to tell all the friends over here that we join all of you in remembering Alito and celebrating Alito. Uh, and, uh, uh, and he had many different histories and always full of surprises, as we all know. And uh, uh, um, and yes, we miss him a lot. Hello, uh, I'm Suhat Sarekar. I would like to just uh, say a few words uh, about this uh, book in the sense the way it got translated. Uh, I was with Alito um, in the last few months, on and off. And uh, then Alito mentioned that uh, there's a book that he's coming out with and all this sort of thing. And I uh, naturally asked him which language, he said English. I said, all Goans, all writing about this book, uh, everyone knows, why don't you uh, have a Kokhani version of it? Dinesh is a very good friend of mine, so I thought uh, I would put Dinesh onto Alito, and then Alito was very happy that Kokhani book will have a Kokhani book. Mm, uh, incidentally, uh, we also thought, why not have a Marathi book? Uh, Marathi translation, so it can spread wider. Because Kokhani, as uh, uh, all the publishers have told you, has got a very small market. So we thought, why not Marathi? So uh, it went on, but this happened so fast that before anything could be decided, uh, Alito was no longer with us. And uh, then, Vishram gracefully agreed, happily agreed to translate the book in Marathi. Incidentally, we could not find anyone who had this sort of a social background and who could understand the issues and translate it in Kokni. There were people that didn't have the time. So the Kokni project just remained. In fact, we actually made a plea to all the authors that I don't you translate your own article and give it to us. Knowing that every article would be different, but it would be from the same author. But there too, we did not get any success. So the Kokhani project still remains. We will try and do it. And the thing which I should have done a bit before is to congratulate the team for coming out with this book and that too on this day, which, uh, you know, Alito is always with us, but on this day, we'll, uh, we cannot forget him. And another small point I want to make is that Alito also had said that this was the first book. He had some more things and more stories and all that sort of thing. So I would request Pavita to take the lead and you know, continue the good work that Alito has started. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Suhas. Uh, uh, would Professor Rosa Maria Perez like to speak? Uh, can you can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you, Rosa. Hi, Alexander. Hi, Gabriel. <laughs> thank you so much for this moving tribute. Yeah. So, first of all, thank you all for this wonderful tribute to Alitos memory and and life academic and personal well 
it's difficult to talk about Alito without a deep emotion. <laughs> I first met him almost 30 years ago, and but it was uh, in 1999 when I started carry, the, carry out field work That's in Goa that we became very, very close. And I'd like to, 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 to say that close as mm -hmm. colleagues and close as friends. As, well, as along with Milan, his wonderful uh, wife and my dear friend, they always hosted me, cooking for me the little fishes that I love, but also sharing their knowledge uh, uh, with me. And but that, that that's on a personal basis. And until the end of Alito's life, where I was in in Gujarat and in close touch with my dear friend Koshi Tarakan, um, until the end, I'd like to, and up to today, I'd like to underscore Alito's influence in my own writing. Uh, first of all, uh, when I started, as I say, uh, getting out research in Goa as an anthropologist, as a social anthropologist in a web of connections that at that, th at that time included Alexander, Bob and Susanna, uh, Alito uh, had immediately uh, found affinities between, between ourselves. Of course, I had worked with a, a cast of Dalit and lived with Dalits for a long period. So we had that in common that still persists in my life to, uh, to value not only the knowledge, but more than that of the so-called subaltern. But I would like to underscore something that is not only an academic, an academic quality of Alito, but also a personal uh, uh, quality, is uh, his enormous compassion and his enormous generosity. Uh, since day one, he supported my PhD students. I think some of them may be this audience, like Pedro Pomb, Claudia Pereira, uh, Jason Fernandes, uh, um, well, Raquel Pereira, well, and others, but he, he was also a consultant for a research project that I carried out in the early, uh, that I supervised in the early 20s. And most of that project is Alito's, as Alito's imprint. So I'd like, I'd like to say so many things that are, that don't fit in the, in the, in the time and space of this, of this meeting of this tribute and so many other people would like to talk. But I'd like to, to tell you that when I write, and of course, as an, an anthropologist, as my friends and colleagues in this audience know, I write from the perspective of the subaltern and I teach from the perspective of the subaltern, so-called subaltern, uh, who are them, who am I? Um, Indeed, uh, Alito is there. Alito is always there. There is, I will have a, a little tribute to his memory uh, now at ICAS, the International Convention of Asian Scholars, where I was invited to co-organize a panel on academic freedom. And Alito, of course, is there because he, he had compassion, he has generosity, he, all, he, he, he taught us all a lot. And, uh, but he, he also uh, taught us or the, the, the importance of freedom, of academic freedom, of individual freedom, of freedom in a word. So I would like to say, as I said, so many things and I'm very moved, but I remember that one, he brought many, many dear friends to my life with my late Dear friend Madhvi Sardesai, we shared so many trips to the field, so many long conversations, uh, days and days over the, the, the years. But uh, he also brought to my life dear friends like Maria Aurora Kurt, whom he wanted us to meet each other. And indeed, it was an epiphany when I first met her and so many other friends and colleagues. So rather than a colleague or a friend, I'd like to, without any demagogy, to call myself a student of Alito. And I'd like to thank him for so many that he, he taught me. And 
uh, I think that Milan is, is, is listening to us. Thank you, Milan, uh, for being Alifo, Alito's best um, friend, wife, love, and for being my friend as well. Uh, to the best of my capacities, I will keep his memory alive and it, it, it is alive, he is alive until the end of my life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, I think now we have uh, Mr. Bob New uh, Newman with us. Yes. Hello, Bob. We can't hear Sir. you. you Please unmute yourself. Please unmute. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. This is the problem. Uh, is it? Are you? Can you hear? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm. I'm sorry to be technologically a little deficient here, but uh, I would just like to add a small amount because uh, I know there are so many people here, and. Uh, I would. I I knew Alito for many years. I met him. I think in 1982. Uh, he was a student, perhaps at that time. I didn't know him very well then, but over the years, uh, when I came to Goa, I would always meet Alito and uh, Milan, and uh, I enjoyed their hospitality, their friendship, and their knowledge, uh, especially uh, to do with you know my work in Goa as an anthropologist. Uh, I also met Alito in Portugal, and he came to my house here in America a couple of times. And uh, so I, I miss him a lot. He was a man, <clears throat> excuse me, he was a man with a great heart and a very interesting mind. And uh, I believe that he did something that's very rare no matter whether, where you are, in India or America or any other country. And that is, he had compassion for his students. I really admired how he dealt with all the students and helped them and encouraged them. Uh, I wish that I could have done the same with many of my students. Though I tried, I would say I was not as successful as he was. And if people say, well, he didn't write, I think he did a lot more than that. Uh, he was a great man. And uh, well, that's really what I want to say. I miss him and I'll always remember him as long as I live. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you, Bob. I welcome, think, you're uh, welcome, you're welcome. <laughs> would uh, Norma Cordero want to speak? you want to add something? Please unmute yourself. Hello. Yes, uh, can hear you now. Yeah. Well, like Bob and uh, Professor Bob and Rosa Marie, who I met in Alito's house, uh, I just wanted to say uh, Milan has been really a great part of Alito's life and work, silently in the background, a pillar of support. And she was also a go-to person for him. He often consulted Milan when he was really at a loss or stuck or very disheartened because as a personal friend of Alito's for 40 years, I know that Alito was impatient. He wanted so much of change. He wanted so much of uh, improvement in the society and sometimes the very people he wanted to help and he thought they should be doing more and fighting more and he would sometimes want to give up maybe 
But I think uh, Milan's wisdom and uh, her uh, input, her insights, helped him to develop that equanimity and to take a step back sometimes and have more patience with his work, although their work was very separate. They shared the same kind of values and ideals and worked for the same kind of outcomes in the society. Milan, through art and art workshops and her creativity and uh, helping the economically disadvantaged women to earn more and so on through their handicrafts and stuff. And um, Ali taught through his work, through his students. And uh, till the end, I think she was a source of great strength for Alito always. So that's what I wanted to say. Um, and uh, I want to congratulate all these students who have worked so hard. And I want to congratulate Vishal Gupte for taking all the trouble to do the Marathi translation, which is so difficult. It was a huge job he undertook, most gladly, I think, for Alito's sake. Um, well done to everyone, everyone who has made this happen. Thank you, Norma. Thank you. Uh, we have a uh, professor, Susan Sado, with us. Yes, I'm here. Yes, we, we can hear you. Hi, how are you? Hi. I'm fine. We're Hello. all fine. Hello, Susanna. Hi, Alexander. How are you? Hi, Bob. Hi, Rosa. Hi, everywhere. everyone. Uh, hi, Norma. How are you? Well, I think I don't have much to say about uh, how wonderful person was Alito because I think all our common friends already spoke about this. I had the privilege to, to meet Alito, I don't know, 30 years ago or more. And, uh, but I had the privilege also to have Alito here in my university during one year. Uh, and uh, he was teaching here and uh, he was also influencing our students. Uh, we had an agreement with the University of Goa in 2000, the year 2000, and uh, Alito came in 2002 and 2003 and he stayed here also. Milan came. So I had uh, the possibility to show Alito what he also showed me in Goa, the other parts of Goa. So I showed him the other parts of Portugal also with Alexander and, uh, and Gabriel. And, um, and, and also to introduce him to our colleague uh, Samuel Araujo from Brazil, who cannot be here. Uh, but um, he went to Brazil to work a little bit in a favela of Maré with Professor Samuel Araujo who is a, an ethnomusicologist. And, uh, well, you know that Alito was always trying to, to find out other ways of working outside of the mainstream. So working with, um, uh, in a favela in Maré, uh, in, in a favela in Rio de Janeiro was like uh, being uh, in touch, hi, Gabriel, being in touch with, with other way of, uh, other Brazil uh, and uh, uh, always as Professor Rosa Maria uh, uh, emphasized always with the, this, the subaltern way of seeing the world and speaking about the world. Um, well, I remember the first time um, Alito came to my house, I was uh, finishing my PhD thesis, it was in 2002 and um, I was, uh, I was, um, well, so he saw my library uh, in Go uh, about Goa. He was very surprised to see a library on Goa in, in Aveiro. And uh, I, I was uh, very surprised with this post-colonial way of seeing the world. And he told me, uh, 
Do you know a guy called Walter Mignolo? This was in 2001 or 2003, two. Uh, he's speaking about something called decolonial thinking. So this is very interesting to see that for me, it was a surprise. And uh, it was not so many, nobody was, uh, I think, even in the in, in the anthropologists in, in the north, I don't know, Alexander, but in 2001, nobody was speaking about the colonial thing, no? But he was calling me and, well, I bought this book because of him. Yes. Okay? Yes. Well, so I bought this know. book. I was trying to see, he, he's signed by Walter Mignolo because Walter came here for a conference and but I bought, I, I knew Walter Mignolo and I came into this concept of place of enunciation because of Alito. And uh, he came from Goa teaching me here what is the South uh, American way of seeing the world. And uh, in a certain way, he was a very premonitory uh, person. Okay, well, he was... Um, uh, writing before the mainstream, he was thinking before uh, uh, the, 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 those who came from privileged places and then are the stars now. So I think this book is very important because he sh it should be spread through the, acad the academies, different academies in, in other uh, places. I'm, I want to include him in the bibliography of my students and to spread him to Brazil and to the other places where this decolonial thinking is creating uh, roots. And I think that elite should be included in this, in this um, well, constellation of thinkers that produce knowledge on decolonial way of seeing the world. Well, thank you for inviting me for, for this, uh, and this moment and this tribute. And, Thank you all, Favita, Avita, uh, Mozinha, and um, I'm, I'm expecting to work with you, Mozinha, as Alito used to tell me, you, you should work with Mozinha, okay? So we should work about music. And um, as Alito uh, also was a, a music lover, and uh, okay, we should keep Alito in our uh, minds and in our words. Thank you and congratulations for all this. Thank you. Well said, Susanna. Thank you, Frederick, also for this. Thank you for speaking with us, uh, Susanna. Um, I'll call, I now call uh, Celia Ribeiro to speak with us. Hello, Celia. Hello. Okay, we'll. Uh, I think we'll move on. Hi, Celia. Hi. Okay. Hi, Celia. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Celia. Yeah, we can, we can hear you now. Switch on your okay. video. Uh, can, you, can, I be, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but not so clear. Switch on your feedback. Celia, you could try muting your speakers. Celia, mute your speakers. Yeah, one minute. Hello? Yeah. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Celia. I thank you hi. for this wonderful celebration of the life of my brother. It was uh, uh, a very tedious task to put all these things together. So I thank you for doing all this. I thank all the speakers 
who have given us insights about the book and about alit and uh, most of all i thank the students for overcoming their fears their anxiety and courageously opening their minds and that made it possible for alito to deliver his god given talent and knowledge and that gave him surely a lot of satisfaction in life but it was possible as uh, norma has already said all this was possible because he had milan with him all through and milan's wisdom and ability to discern and understand and give him guidance is what made alito do what he has done so i thank god for all this and thank each one of you who have in different ways been his friends his students and have done everything for him thank you thank you celia thank you alexander thank you celia thank you thank you celia um we have a uh, dr samit uh, khande parkar next samit are you there would you like to speak okay we have uh, some people raising hand so uh, can i call vishal oh, uh, sorry liz we have uh, you know some authors who have raised their like raised and then unraised their hand um, so can we have them maybe to speak yeah sure sure yeah samit has passed his uh, yes. and he said you like i just saw that and uh, yes the authors can come up and speak unmute and speak so maybe you can uh, invite one of them and then follow up mozina would you like to say something uh, yes am i audible yes hi mozina i'm a student of Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I'm a student of the Alito. With due respect and gratitude, I would like to express myself through this platform. It was Sir Alito who helped me to break the silence and helped me to bring out my voice in the form of writings and especially in the form of writing of poems. when i was confused as to what should i work on for my ma dissertation and i could not think of any topic it was sir who helped me in researching my own gauda community he was the one who motivated me to write my dissertation i can recall what he said to me once he said mozina you start writing write whatever you feel like to that's when i said to myself that i should write and i began writing he was the first teacher with whom i could share my experiences of my life and my pain <clears throat> sorry of my life and my pain without his guidance support and motivation i could have not been able to express myself i'm sure if he would have been here he would have been very happy at this moment seeing me and hearing my voice in front of all the audience today here talking fearlessly on this platform a silent voice which has been transformed into expression thank you very much thank you mozina um Preeti, would you like to come and say something? Or Vanisha? Yes. 
Yes. Yes. Can you hear yes. me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Today is a very happy day for all of us, and I'm sure Sir Alito is also very happy at this book launch. At the onset, I would like to thank the team behind this book in, in making this book a reality. You know, it's been a decade or so. <laughs> We all have been waiting for this book. I will not take much time, but as the name suggests, you know how con or who am I? Sir Alito took his students on this journey of self-discovery, of you know finding ourselves, our strengths, and even our weaknesses to understand from where these weaknesses came from. And uh, you know he not only taught us, but he touched our lives, and he touched our lives in such a way that he transformed us forever. I remember when I showed him what I had written after visiting Kurdi for the first time. He said, "Why don't you work on this for your dissertation?" Uh, at that point of time, we were, you know, searching topics like, uh, you know, to do a, uh, to do my dissertation, and that was uh, also the time that I first visited Kurdi. And I said, "So, but how? This is so personal. This is so emotional." And from there, the journey to unearth more stories began. Uh, you know, and uh, and this ultimately culminated into a documentary uh, titled remembering kurdi by somya nanda sahi what sir taught us was that every student every story counts as a student you know a decade back as a student and to be told this that my experience counts my insights count you know that my inputs count and that too in an academic world was a big thing so alito taught us that in higher education we are not the consumers of knowledge but the creators of knowledge and that is that is what he has done with his students and he has also taught us to question the existing knowledge there is really so much to talk on sir and so many of you have shared so many beautiful experiences on uh, you know with him but as one of the priest at his funeral service said you know he said that alito was an institution in himself like a true sociologist he never passed judgment and he was ever so concerned and welcoming he treated us like his you know his own children and you know sir alito is like you only feel happy you only feel you know motivated and so inspired even for some time i was not keeping in touch with him but you know I, he was ever so present i am so glad that i had the opportunity to be his student and alito the story lives on in his students and every one of us who came in touch with him thank you very much thank you so much venisha for sharing this with us um, can we have uh, dr maria arora kutta to speak to us Dr. Barya, can we have Vishal Rolly to speak to us? Hello, hi. Yes, hi. Uh, I just want to talk about what Alito always said was uh, his next mission. uh when uh, how con was uh, already getting his direction and uh, he was very happy that students were taking it on and uh, there were so many people to help him um he said what i would like to do is to work increasingly with my own community uh, with the upper caste people and um, he said uh, we have to acknowledge the wounds uh, we as a community have inflicted um and he said um it's you know he had all these dilemmas uh, he had these complications which made him such a beautiful emotional sensitive person <clears throat> and uh, he had it almost like had a guilt feeling about him working with uh, his students from the tribal community he just wanted them uh, to speak for themselves and himself to just recede to the background so he didn't want to produce so much of his own writing rather than give them the voice to speak 
and he said for me the mission should be to talk to my own community and uh, whether it's the upper caste or uh, people from the uh, colonizer uh, countries and he said there's a lot of work uh, that is needed to unpack uh, the kind of uh, uh, crimes atrocities and the wounds uh, which we have inflicted and also the suffering of our guilt and uh, the kind of uh, realizations we have uh, when we understand uh, what we have perpetrated uh, and so that is was his next uh, mission so i was um, um, i'm i guess uh, happy to be his confidant at times and we shared uh, long car rides and journeys going to um, villages or mining areas and having long conversations and or just going for a snack he was a, a voracious uh, lover of uh, street food and all kinds of um, you know delicacies so along the way of course uh, between mouthfuls we would exchange a lot of uh, conversations so I, that's something he often confessed that you know i really do want to withdraw and my work should be to be working with upper class so you know that is the uh, he said in all these years i've realized uh, working with your own community is also very important rather than you know sort of uh, championing the cause of the subaltern the subaltern should be able to take uh, you know speak for themselves in their own language it writing may not be the form song music might be their form uh, so he all he wanted uh, people to have a place in the academic world but he also uh, didn't want to uh, make the academic world uh, the only platform which uh, you know uh, rises in front of us as the uh, you know where knowledge descends so you know with all these complications uh, he you know he always messed with our brains but he was also very messed up himself and uh, that made him so wonderful to talk to and um, yeah so i thought um, that something uh, was left unsaid um, something uh, he uh, spoke to me about so that i should share thank you thank you vishal um, uh, can we have more authors speaking okay. rajeshwari if you are there yes we can hear you please continue good evening everyone myself rajeshwari i am one of the author in haupun uh, back in days when i was in university i never had a trust in me that i can write like i was not even confident in talking in english one day i asked like sir can i write like i don't know i'm not so good in english i don't have anybody at home who speaks in english and he said it's not necessary you have to write in english you can write in your own language but you have to mention that you are going to write in your own language but later i studied english and i was able to write my work is on my identity that i'm trying to find who i am i'm coming from an fishing community that girls are not given that much important to study but luckily my parents encouraged and i was in university i was very lucky to have sir elito as my guide and he put lot of trust in me that i can write i can express my thoughts i was so puzzled i don't know what to write there were so many thoughts in my mind but his proper guidance helped me to put my words my experiences and i thank him thank him a lot and i thank all the team who have supported and brought this book into a reality thank you so much thank you rajeshwari uh, sir sachin hello can you hear me yes you are audible please continue okay in the first place uh, congratulations to the whole team and uh, i'm happy to be part of the book as one of the authors and uh, in fact like uh, i believe like just like uh, salito that there is no beginning and the end uh, reality is always multiple and uh, uh you can never express realities in a true form like only written through words or through uh what you say to any other form but realities are always multiple and basically like uh 
coming back to this uh, uh, to this whole thing like you know uh, where this started like in fact out of all these uh, uh, different authors here and as i am part of it like i am actually the odd man out uh, they are all nine uh, women who have written and i am uh, just one man amongst the rest of them and in fact uh, this was the same uh, point you know like uh, when actually when i was doing this work uh, back in the university in 2005 uh, he happened to ask me like uh, why would you be interested in a in a in a topic like this to work on uh, which is more you know has to deal with the women and not uh, you know like the normal other aspects that you would like to research upon in in uh, the field of sociology and um, i basically had something uh, you know that in part i shared a life which was similar to what women experience and that's how like i found like i was connected to this idea and in fact my initial title would would have been like you know that uh, in konkani for example uh, uh, janna go by rasta uh, baila uh goyan folga marta with a question mark and uh, there were lots of uh things that were written actually in the initial uh work which were too explicit and i remember like uh sitting with him under the tree somewhere on the road or even somewhere where we were like you know having a uh, tea together and he was uh, we had lengthy discussion and basically agreements and disagreements that uh, you know like whether i'll be able to defend what i felt the strongest uh, as almost a part of life shared with the women in my place where i belong to that was kunkoli and uh, uh, it it in a way like uh, uh, i would say like ignited the spirit of of doing research in a different way and more than anything what i uh, uh, what i would like to conclude from that was that uh, it ignited into me like to take from him a lot of uh, his ways of uh, doing things in the classroom like right now i am myself a teacher learner i always call myself a teacher learner and and uh, i took from him a lot of things that he practiced in the class uh, you know like because we did have multiple uh, different type of learners and plural backgrounds that they came from and uh, how would we still address every single student as a child and bring out the best in them and uh, i think i have been able to live up to that and uh, you know uh, i owe a lot to him to his contributions to me and in what i have become today and once again i would i would not take much of time because i know there are many people waiting to speak and uh, thank you uh, one and all uh, for this effort and i think uh, alitos uh, it's not the memories but rather it's the it's the uh, it's the force that he ignited into us that lives on and i think we need to take it up from there and continue in the same spirit thank you so much thank you sir sachin uh, is can we have priyanka Kushbu Please am I audible Yes we can hear you yes please control Hello everyone it's my privilege to be student of sir alito it was a decade ago that was in 2010 i got an opportunity to work under sir sir's guidance changed my life because of his different way of teaching and learning methodology he made me to think critically sir alito 
was an expert in turning one's limitation into strength. And that's what he did to me. To be frank, and this I often used to say to Sir, writing was not my passion. But Sir's experiment made me to write. My first piece of writing, you can see in Haukon. So drawing title for this book, Haukon, from my work gives recognition to my writing itself. To add on, we have scholar from Brazil who wrote a paper on our work titled Memory, Post Memory and the Role of Narratives Among Women Writers from the Adivasi Communities of Goa, which gives much wider recognition. So I stop here as I was given two minutes to speak. So in Ali Tusa's words, all power to Hong Kong. Thank you. Thank you, Priyanka. Uh, Mr. Alex Rodericks, would you like to speak now? Yeah, hello. So this yes, is, we can uh, hear you. Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I know Alito from, from school days. Uh, we met uh, in, a, in, in a student organization when early 70s. Uh, so I'm very happy to be part of this occasion because it brings uh, uh, memories of Alito and also Alito lives on in the lives he touched and from what I've heard. So the early 70s were days when we were part of student organization. It was a days of formation also for all of us because we uh, we broke away from traditional uh, ways of uh, from, from school to college and things like that. Alito uh, began to also uh, work uh, uh, when we had a work campus uh, and then decided to uh, stay in a, in a small farmhouse in a place called Colum and explore working with uh, workers and things like that. So those are the early stages. But what really, uh, uh, you know, what, listening to each one of uh, both the professors and students, uh, it shows how Alito uh, lived his life and touched many lives. And uh, the question of who I am was a question that Alito uh, had within himself and we all had within ourselves because it was uh, almost a, a conflict of trying to understand who you are in, 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 in reality where there were a lot of uh, conflicting issues that you confronted. His sense of social justice, his sense of equality, his sense of uh, coming from a background that uh, could have also been uh, a question mark in, in itself. So, Though he didn't write very much, but uh, you can see his writings coming through uh, people who have spoken and who have written also. And I'm happy to know that he touched uh, lives uh, of students who, who now are able to write about themselves and come from backgrounds which are so diverse. And uh, So uh, I was there in the 70s uh, and a group of us from Margaon who uh, little was from Mapsa at that time, but he lived in uh, with us, uh, with, and we knew each other's families very well because we used to live in each other's house. And uh, I was there when he also passed away in Bangalore. And he still had the spirit uh, of of life even in his last few days. Uh, and I am also grateful uh, to uh, to him who has touched my life and all the people who have written now who have touched my life to see that Alvito still lives on. And also to Milan, who was a very strong support of Alito. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alex. Uh, can we have uh, Mr. Jyotish Sri Kumar? Uh, hi. Um, I only have something uh, personal to share. Um, I know Alito uncle and Milan auntie from childhood, and they were very good friends of my father, Professor Sri Kumar, who was also at Goa University, and my mother, Rajashree. So we lived close to each other for over two decades, and as families, we spent a lot of time with each other and at each other's homes. 
and a very strong memory of my growing up is listening to the two professors, Alit Onkel and my dad, deep in discussion over many topics of pedagogies and research frameworks and everything else like that. They loved talking about our family dinners. And now both of them have, have moved on from this life. And to me, Alit Onkel is like a father figure and they were both my mentors. So after I lost my father, if there was someone, I would have gone to discuss my own career. And it would have been Ali Tonkel. And to me, it's a deep personal void that he's no longer here in this physical environment. At the same time, he'll continue to live on in my memories. So it's it's wonderful to see this tribute to Ali Tonkel and his work and the work he has inspired and the outpouring of love for him as a person and as a professor and mentor. Thank you. That's all I had to share. Thank you so much. Uh, can we have uh, Samir Kelita to share with us? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, you are audible. Yeah, OK. Um, I knew Alito in the 70s, uh, but I have to give a little bit of background. Uh, the thing is that um, there was this guy called Hugo de Souza. A few of you might remember him. He was a journal, a philosopher, and a friend of my father. Now, my father was a Kokani activist, freedom fighter, not very comfortable with English, and um, quite conservative, while Hugo was the other opposite, not so comfortable in Kokani, all Western, uh, meaning at least superficially, he would look very Western. And the thing with Hugo was he used to hang out with these young boys. Alito was one of them. There are others. Alex was there, who just spoke. Hartman was there. Leopard was there. And many others were there. And the nice thing was that I was in high school, and the influence of these guys was so much that it opened my mind. In fact, they had a huge library called Ideas, where there were all kinds of books on sociology and everything. That it became, um, you know, my life's goal not to like make money, but to be as intelligent as these guys. And then. I went to IIT, I'm a technologist basically, but at IIT also I participated in student movements and the influence of Hugo, Alito and others has been so much on me, much more than IIT. I went to the US, did a PhD, but nothing compared to these people. And then again, I was in touch with Alito. He was in the university. He was a go-to man for me in the university. And he was like, joking around. He says, you are NRI. You are like a son-in-law of the government. Your father is a freedom fighter. He's also a son-in-law of the government. So you guys are just both son-in-laws of the government. And the thing is that the trust level was so much. And meaning we were young guys. If you had a crush on someone in the university, first thing would be to go to Alito and find out the details about the about the person. Okay. And the nice thing is that he married Milan, and Milan is sister of my close friend Milan, who was my classmate at IIT. Okay. So, but unfortunately, I then came back from the US. I'm in Bangalore now. And you know, I work for an MNC. I lost touch, meaning I last 20 years I have not been in uh, much touch with uh, Alito. Uh, but, um, you know, the thing is that Alito, of course, was a rebel, an anti-establishment person, and guy would question everything. And sometimes I feel that uh, being in the university, you know, he should have been leading movements and uh, doing, meaning that's the kind of uh, brain he had. And Hugo used to call him the future of sociology in, in India. I feel very sad that he passed away so young. That's it. Thank you, Samir. Thank you, Mr. Samir. Uh, we'll have uh, Miguel Braganza now to speak with us. Uh, 
Thank you. The Alito I know is from my school days when I was in the fifth and he was in the tenth in the same school. And at that time, he was a boxer. With Eric Kimenezes and others, he would be boxing in Nalting and I would be fascinated just to watch them do it. He was a lean, muscular guy, would take on people maybe one and a half times his weight and still win. The Alito that I met later on at the university when I worked there for two years was a completely different person outwardly. It was like uh, Sylvester Stallone from Rocky becoming George Burns from Oh God. Of, for those who watch Bollywood, someone as dashing as Vinod Khanna becoming someone transforming like Amol Palekar. A completely different kind of person. But within a year, I realized that the Sylvester Stallone in him, the Rocky in him, had not died. He took on the establishment right up to the deputy registrar when there was a Marx scandal. And one deputy registrar and one assistant registrar had to resign because he pursued the case till it was proved that they were guilty. And so that Rocky was still there in Alito. He didn't care about his career. He was working for the university and he was taking on the university establishment. Not an easy thing for anybody to do. But he pursued it till the end through the twists and turns till he got it done. Alito was not formally my teacher. But I have learned a lot of things from him. He had ways of influencing you even in the canteen. The university canteen is where some of times we used to meet. It was a canteen of sorts in those years because we were in the parking lot of the vice chancellor's office that was the canteen. And there he would interact to talk about things. And then he would talk about different things which uh, Vishram Gupta has rightly said. He was a disruptor of your entire thinking process. He would make you think and rethink your ideas and get them out. I was in touch with him till maybe two months before he passed away. And he always had something to say. I've known the family, his elder sister Fatima and younger brother Radino, of course, is a good friend of mine. The younger sister Celia, I just know. But within that family also, if you look at Ali, he's completely different. He does not have any resemblance in his activities, in his academic pursuits to what the others did. And very nice that there is a book now remembering him. Well, that is one thing that he did not do, to author a book to be remembered by. And we have, and thanks to the team and to all the students, because he has influenced their thinking and he has influenced the way they see themselves. And that, to my mind, is his legacy that I also carry forward with my own students. It's to make them know who they are and to take it from there onwards forward. Thank you for this opportunity to share a few thoughts on Alito. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Praganza. And now we have uh, Joachim Dias. Hi, uh, thanks everyone, uh, and especially Frederick and his team who has, you know, organized the, uh, you know, such a lovely event. Uh, and, you know, to remember, you know, Professor Alito. Uh, I was from his, uh, I, I can say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just remembering Alito and, and may his soul rest in peace. He is always in my thoughts. Uh, I am from his batch of 2004 from uh, Goa University. And I remember especially coming from a college directly into the classrooms of Goa University with the approach, you know, where we were, you know, in the colleges, we're told 
just, you know, it was all rote learning. But when we entered the university, uh, there was Alito waiting with his unique approach of thinking outside the box, of, you know, of thinking differently, innovatively, you know, uh, you know, questioning, uh, you know, uh, our thoughts. And sometimes as students, I, I can say even I felt a bit bitter. Oh, everything seems to be wrong. You know, you know, whatever you write seems to be wrong. But it was all that questioning, ask yourself why you have written that, why you're writing, why you're doing that, you know, how you could write differently. But then after that, you know, now that I'm a researcher in the uh, United Kingdom University, uh, I realize the importance of the approach uh, that has helped me and is still helping me, you know, to build up my career each and every moment. You know, the very thing of asking, you know, the, that book, Hong Kong, you know, just asking even what, whatever you're writing, what you are writing, you know, you know, question yourself, question your thoughts, you know, all that is, you know, uh, I would say I received first from uh, Professor Alito at Goa University. And I also remember another student, how he was supportive of, you know, each and every student. Uh, uh, you know, I was getting to know him, you know, during my two years when I was there, doing my tourism uh, dissertation and everything. Uh, and as students, you know, we were economically really, you know, uh, you know, uh, tight with our pockets. And I remember it was Alito who gave me another student a voice. He said, you have a paper to present on tourism. Uh, but I want to give you all a chance, you know, take this cash, take a ticket, uh, you know, and go for a conference in Udaipur, Rajasthan. You know, it was such a great opportunity, you know, to, uh, you know, have Alito as a mentor, do your uh, lovely project, you know, under his mentorship. And then he giving you a voice to go and, and to speak to hundreds of, you know, professors, readers from different universities from all over India in the field of sociology and social studies. So I, I won't take long. Um, I really, you know, remember his contribution that he has done for our course and towards me. And I would say I'm still, it's ongoing. It's part of me. It's, it's part of my process. Uh, uh, it's part of, of my identity. And I would say we, everyone, you know, in Goa, uh, need to use this opportunity of asking who I am, you know, the Goan identity, how con, you know, everyone can ask that. And that will bring us, uh, you know, to a greater realization and, a, you know, and a consciousness. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Jokin. Uh, can we have uh, Kastob Naik now? Hi, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Uh, hi, uh, hi, hi, hi. Good morning from where, where I am right now. I am a doctoral student at uh, University of Pennsylvania. And uh, I think those of you have spoken before, uh, most of them are Alito's friend or his students. And I think there is a third category of people uh, that that I think needs to be slightly represented is, you know, the younger scholars that came or uh, uh, that worked on Goa. I would I mean, like, I was not Alito's student, um, but, uh, but he, I mean, at some point I just was inculcated in the mentees that, you know, the long list of sort of mentees that Alito had. And, um, yeah, and that's how I was introduced to Alito as somebody who was researching on Goa while I was in Delhi. And uh, since then, our sort of uh, relationship has sort of continued. And uh, Alito, I mean, uh, uh, I'm slightly overwhelmed also now remembering him. And uh, I, I'll, I'll share one personal anecdote that he had. And this is one of his, I mean, in his last days, uh, one of my play was being staged in, in Goa and um, he called me up and said, you know, I, I need to come see your play and can you get me tickets? I said, so, sir, it's, 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 um, it's free, of course, you can just come in. He said, but just keep me two seats, you know, and one seat just near the door. Uh, and I was puzzled as why he would make the request. And later only uh, he told me that he was, he was, 
uh, not keeping well and probably said if i if i don't feel easy uh, if i if i feel uneasy while in the theater i might just have to leave but he stayed back for the play met me after had had a long discussion and um, yeah and that's probably his his last meeting um, that i remember very vividly and uh, we he would often come to delhi and we would meet um over lunch or dinner and he introduced me to a lot of other professors there um uh and uh, you know one thing i wanted to say that there has been this whole thing of alito did not write and you know that has been always the mystery of why professor alito never wrote so much that he could have and uh, i think it's one of the perils of the academic uh, world is that you know you're judged by how much knowledge you produce in the written form but i think for alito uh, all of us can make an exception that alito did not write papers but he wrote a lot of people a lot of people like us a lot of people who have now who will go ahead and write a lot of things about themselves about goa and how kon is perhaps one of the one of the star uh, you know star example of that kind of effort as as a pedagogue as a professor he has sort of empowered a, a generation of scholars um who will work on and from goa and i think that is perhaps the biggest contribution uh, as a teacher one could ever dream to make and alito has sort of succeeded in doing that so yeah more power to him more power to his students and the kind of work that will live on from here on and yeah thank you Thank you so much. Uh, can we have Dr. Sheila Gupte? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello, Sheila. Hello, Alexander. So nice to see you and to hear you. Um, so many of Alito's friends to spoken and talked about their memories. it seems as if uh, everyone thought that they were special friends of alito and uh, we knew alito for more than 35 years and i would like to share some of my own memories so vishram and i came to goa more than 35 years back and ali was alito was one of our very early friends so we came here as a naive couple from nagpur in maharashtra and we had a 3 month old baby with us and we did not know what we were really walking into so at that time the language agitation the konkani movement and identity politics in goa were peaking uh, at the same time when we came and we tried to make sense of these churnings and currents in goan society it surely impacted our own personal and professional pursuits so alito was one friend with whom we could always discuss these fine uh, the fine nuances of our experiences as we struggled to find our own feet in a new land so we had friends professional colleagues uh, acquaintances uh, many of them didn't know how to place us in those days i was konkani speaking but my konkani was different from what is spoken in goa Vishram was Marathi speaking, and our name was certainly non-Goan. So many of our acquaintances uh, and friends valued us as friends and humans. I was also, of course, useful as a doctor, but most people were often confused whether they could accept us as their own, as one of them, them, or were we to be treated as outsiders. So were we bhaile or were we bitulle? Were we uh, one of them or were we someone else from outside? So Alito was one friend with whom we could talk and analyze these sometimes funny, sometimes tragic issues very frankly without holding anything back. Nothing was taboo for Alito. We could talk to him about anything, literally anything, personal relations, relations with our parents. our in-laws children we always knew that he would not be judgmental and so he was almost like a counselor for many of his friends we didn't always agree with him and we sometimes didn't take his advice but he almost always helped us to understand issues from different perspectives 
but of all these discussions what i cherish most is interacting with him as our two boys were growing up alito and milan were there for us whenever we needed them whenever we needed a sounding board through these the trying times that our boys were growing up and becoming men both satyajit and abhijit really miss him very sorely today i used to often joke that alito liked to focus on and analyze the pathology of human interactions he obsessed on the less talked about and the more painful aspects of human conditions and human relationships so we often spoke about how we would prepare for our old age or death or how we would face serious illness and i used to say to him that all these discussions are fine but how we actually behave when our time comes is really unpredictable so i have seen seemingly very composed people breaking down and apparently hysterical people go through crises with the calmness of almost like spiritual gurus but i must say that i was truly dumbfounded to see the grace and the equanimity with which alito faced these matters in his own life how he meticulously planned all his matters his personal uh, issues financial matters even his own medical treatment till the end was truly mind boggling on one of our visits to his place we saw him sorting out his collection of books giving detailed instructions about which book should go to whom in case he did not make it through his treatment his sense of humor had not left him and i was really stunned today i salute his courage and his self knowledge his grace he was graceful in health and happiness as well as in the face of tragedy ill health and death really we miss you alito we miss you very much thank you for letting me share some of my memories uh, about alito thank you Thank you, Dr. Sheila Gupte. Uh, we will have Professor Koshi speak with us now. Uh, thanks, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, as I was just uh, turning my microphone on, I could see Gasper's message: "Time is not an issue." And well, I must say this is truly Alito's, uh, you know, presence. When because when you are with Alito, uh, you know, the time stops moving. So. i mean as many of us who have been associated with him uh, might uh, remember whenever we meet in the canteen and all you know cups of tea after <laughs> cups alito would shout from that uh, you know uh, table ani ek one more like that it goes on so the time was never a constraint with alito uh, let me first of all congratulate the whole team who who finally succeeded in bringing out this one book which alito was eagerly looking forward to i mean i remember uh, the formation of these essays as part of his colleague in the uh, university where sometimes we have discussed along with alito and some of the authors when they were writing this i mean the process of writing these dissertations i too had the opportunity to be part of uh, that process so i am really happy that uh, ultimately this uh, has materialized Uh, and uh, you know my association with alito goes back to 1996 when i joined goa university as a lecturer so i became alito's colleague but over the years that relation developed into more of a friendship and towards the end we were even neighbors so as a colleague one thing which i always uh, you know value in alito is his commitment to his students and his lectures you know he was always experimenting with you know uh, his uh, class and uh, even you know when he was uh, bringing in this uh, new pedagogy to his uh, class uh, sometime uh, towards the middle of his career i was a bit skeptical about uh, its you know relevance in teaching at Uh, university uh, so uh, but uh, to cut a long story a story short let me say that he finally won uh, me also to his camp where i you know began to uh, appreciate the, uh, the the pedagogical method which alito was experimenting with um, and 
as a colleague it was not just the teaching and uh, you know uh, academic aspect that uh, you you would like to cherish uh, when you remember alito uh, his you know acute uh, you know uh, knowledge uh, absolute knowledge about the rules and regulations you know uh, of of the governance of a university so whenever you are in uh, doubt about a particular uh, you know ordinance or a uh, a particular aspect of a statute you could always discuss with alito and as uh, i've seen it also in the chat uh, professor regraham trichur mentioning quite uh, quite many times you know when uh, you converse with alito you finally leave more confused than what you were earlier but that confusions come out of a deeper kind of an understanding that you develop so what you thought uh, quite naively to be the case uh, with alito uh, you would begin to see you know it at a more fundamental uh, you know uh, uh, level of depth so he was one of the wonderful colleagues that i had uh, i had uh, at goa university a, a friend uh, whom with whom you know uh, I, I remember two years back you know when i went for the ife uh, how empty i felt because international film festival in india both alito and myself we used to you know uh, research together uh, the 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 films and book the tickets and go almost uh, i mean for the identical movies uh, and uh, coming back many a time having you know dinner outside having a, a drink uh, together so uh, it's often said that you don't get great friends among colleagues you know there are many opinions about it but alito was an exception uh, he was a great colleague and a greater friend too uh, and towards the end of his career at goa university we became neighbors too and it was moved into the same building where i was uh, staying and uh, and even after post retirement i also moved to his neighborhood i mean nagali hills colony so in a way uh, the influence of alito over the years over me as a colleague friend and a neighbor uh, is so much in, i mean so uh, uh, you know uh, great uh, i became part of the family i mean i should say i mean i could see celia Fatima and all here. I mean, there were many occasions when I had the privilege of having this uh, home, uh, you know, made uh, bebin cars and uh, the the uh, mangoes from from Alito's uh, sisters, and uh, I mean, all these uh, wonderful memories. And uh, and Alexander here, I'm sure uh, you will remember our ride in his blue Fiat, a car which Alexander might have driven more than Alito perhaps whenever he was in Goa, the blue Fiat. And of course, I started. Uh, pillion riding with alito on his uh, uh, suzuki bike then the fiat and then the tata indica <laughs> and finally the wagoner the last car that he used all vehicles uh, i was uh, traveling with him and uh, and thanks i my once again i thank all uh, the authors uh, his uh, students uh, the publisher uh, publishers uh, the translator and uh, the organizers of this meeting and my special thanks to alito's family to milan sisters celia fatima and all thank you all thank you professor koshi uh, now can we have dr claudia um hello um, hi to all of you hello um i would like to congratulate everyone for this so beautiful homage and um, just to compliment, I will show some photographs that also show a little. But my main, uh, what I really wanted to share is that the little and Milan uh, have really changed me. Um, so have changed me in personal terms and academically. And uh, this is really a deep meaning in, in my life because now nowadays uh, in many things I do, I also think in a little and Milan, what will they do? And so they really made, they really taught me on how to think. So thank you so much. And I will just share here three photos. Uh, I've met uh, Professor um, Alito, let me see if I can share. Um, yes, I met Professor Alito um, through the classes of Professor Rosa Perez in Portugal. And can you see the, this photograph? I think you can see the photograph. So we, we have here Alexander N, Bob Newman, and Alito. Um, and we met in, uh, in 
Portugal. You could see the photograph? Yes, okay. Yes, we can. So we met in Portugal uh, in this meeting organized by Rosa Perez. And uh, we discussed history and uh, colonization and decolonization. And it was very meaningful for me because uh, that means I worked 12 years in Go on Goa and, and otherwise probably I would not. Uh, secondly, I also like to share a photo that many Portuguese scholars will also have something similar, which were the, the deep discussions we had at a house of Alito and Milan. And um, Alito was taking the photo, that's why he's not in the photo. <laughs> but we can see here Milan and Rosa Perez, myself, Samit Kanderparkar, Jason von Neumann and, and others. And so this was deeply meaningful for me. Um, I did my thesis on what means to be tribal on 21st century among Catholics and Hindus on Gaura. And so it was, my thesis will be another one if I have not met a little. And uh, so I also like to share this. And uh, a little had a lot of influence um, on Goa as we know but also outside Goa with Goans. And so I will share last photo in the thesis of Asawari um, Sardesai Nayak, uh, where he was present at his thesis here in Portugal at Ishkte. And uh, so um, his influence was really uh, across many oceans and many countries and, um, and also many lives. And so um, in a very uh, touching way, I like to say that this keeps very present at my life. I also like to add that besides um, being very pioneering as an intellectual and in personal terms, it was also very political. Um, because in Portugal, we still could not do what he achieved. Uh, in Portugal, the, um, I mean, the deep privileged groups are the Roma people. And we don't have any book written on Roma people by Roma people. <laughs> And now you have that in Goa, no? So the groups who were illiterate now, um, or the ancestors who were illiterate now have a book on them writing, written by them. And also Lito deeply contributed to the inclusion of professors in Goa University of being from the Sherville tribe. Um, and we don't have that in Portugal still. We don't have any professor who is from Roma per people. We still have to achieve it. And that is something that the government of Portugal is trying. And the Ditu, Alito could do it in Goa. So he was deeply influential uh, personally, academically, but also politically. And I just hope we can do in Portugal what he did uh, in Goa. Um, so I also hope that the persons who are at the government and at Goa University can really follow <laughs> because uh, um, we already have in the government uh, a person from a Roma people. Roma people are like the deep privileged groups in Portugal. Um, I hope you can have some from Schedule Tribe in Goa government and keep having more in Goa University because we really, all of us win with diversity. And uh, today we are here from so many countries from so different backgrounds, and it's really a winning, winning with diversity. And just to end, I would like to congratulate uh, Favita Diaz, Mozinha Fernandes, um, Velipa, Elita Bara, all um, co-authors and co-authors of the book, because it's really pioneer and innovative. So all the best. Thank you, Cla Claudia. Uh, can we have uh, Professor Ram Rao Vag to speak to us? Okay, next we have uh, Sushila Mendes. You can unmute and speak.
can we have a uh, gauri patwardhan unmute here okay uh, gauri uh, i think i had messaged you that she isn't feeling well so she might not be okay so okay. we can go ahead with professor sushila yes Hello. yes yes am i am i audible yes yes my first memory of uh, alito is uh, as a young um, 19 year old and today i am more than 60 uh, in sawarden where we all students went and that's the time the police had fired on a worker from mrf and we had gone to protest and uh, we just we were so frightened actually that the police would kill us also and he just jumped out from us who were sitting down in his kurta and uh, that uh, bag he had that jola and he said come on who's going to get frightened of whom let us see and that line struck in my mind throughout my life you know that daring that he showed to a 19 year old and uh, then i got in touch with him again while doing my phd and he's the first man who introduced me to to sites research sites which uh, nobody had told me about and uh, he had this way i don't know whether he did it to others but uh, to me he did that he uh, came to my side and sat down you know he didn't sit across the table he 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 left his chair came on my side made me feel comfortable and uh, and put me at ease to speak to him so i don't know whether that was characteristic of alito but he did that to me and uh, nobody does that you know nowadays we academicians don't do that and therefore when i look at alito's life i uh, sometimes think of uh, my own shortcomings as a academician his unconventional methods i need to use uh, his uh, his uh, way of mentoring people uh, was exceptional which i need to emulate uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity thank you professor uh, can we have dr shubha Uh, hello everyone um i wasn't really expecting to speak i just saw frederick's message a few minutes ago and i'm so glad everybody is here because i was woefully late in coming here and uh, just listening to everyone makes me realize something that i felt when we heard of the tragic news of arito passing i think i have since then realized a few times the importance of rituals of mourning or so on because i think getting together and sharing memories of a person or whichever way you get together is such an important uh, right that that person deserves it's such an important factor in the healing of mourning and uh, i have to thank the organizers for this to have brought everybody together today to share uh our memories of alito and it is so interesting how i can identify with bits and pieces of what everybody has been saying um which just shows uh the kind of person he was so i have to thank my friend and his friend rahul shivastav who's definitely here at, who introduced me to alito when i first came to do field work in goa after that um, i think for like many of us he's kind of became a touchstone for me uh, the day i landed always had to meet alito first we would go out for dinner and uh, you know share everything i'd been doing about work about life and uh, with alito as many of you have said it, the boundaries between work and life and food and drink and everything were always overlapping that he opened my eyes to so many aspects of goa which nobody else would have done uh you know with seriousness with with teasing pulling my leg also as he did with many with his sense of humor um i learned just so much and i miss him very much like all of us do 
it's my great regret i did not see him uh, after he was ill and strangely the last meeting with him was in delhi which he did not like at all he was dying to get back on the flight and leave after a meeting and that was the last time we met so i'm sure there's endless stories that everybody has but for me um, he just was such an important part of not just my working in goa but um, in in ways of working more generally and uh, with this book with hamcorn i feel a strong sense of identification because i was working very closely with one of the authors here mozinia fernandes and right through my project he's called me to his classroom a few times to share what i was doing with the students so i felt very much a part of uh, of the of his class at the time and got to meet a few of these who have become authors and he always said that you know that he had um, sort of got encouraged with this thing of letting these people speak in their way uh, that you know i had something to do with it also in giving that space to mozinia so i feel extremely happy that this book is finally seeing the light of day though sadly without alito among us thank you so much uh, for giving me this few minutes thank you dr shubha uh, uh, dr ragu you can speak now can you hear me uh, yes we can hear you yeah. thank you very much for this opportunity uh, being Uh, listening to all the wonderful things that people have said, and uh, uh, looking back at my interactions with Alito, I can see uh, all those good aspects hitting me in uh, one form or the other, uh, consciously or unconsciously. Uh, I met Alito in 1995 as a rookie PhD student trying to uh, figure out his research in Goa. and i had actually heard about the legend of alito even before i landed in goa now people said oh it should just go to goa university meet up with alito and he will set you on your course and little did i know how he would set me on my course there was never a direct answer to a question a question you posed to alito the answer always came back in form of uh, questions that will trouble you and uh, over the years i have realized uh, alito is not there was not there to provide you answers but allow you to figure out a way to answer your own questions you know and uh, that is something that i have continued uh, uh, cherished and i have continued to replicate in the context of my own students and uh, people don't need to write in order to be scholars you know you also need people uh, who are sounding boards you know uh, enable scholars to become better scholars so for me alito is the consummate scholar who did that difficult job of sitting back and uh, forcing people to ask questions of themselves not just of what they find outside thank you very much uh, the legend of alito lives on forever thank you dr ragu um, and we have frederick narona speak to with us we like to hear you i think we have finished all all the okay yes yes
Can you hear me now? Yeah, uh, thank you for giving me this privilege to speak. Uh, I have been here right from the beginning of the session. Uh, I knew Alito very personally right from the early 70s. He was a very close friend, worked for me and my family. Uh, I was hesitating to speak here because of the kind of company uh, we have kept for the last uh, couple of hours. Uh, very high intellectual people from all over the world. But I felt I needed to speak because I knew Alito very closely. Alito was one of the first people who mentored us way back in 1980s when we were very young people to start Goa's first film society. We started the film society and we gave it a very rare name. We called it Vichitra, which means different. And I think that symbolizes Alito at that time because he was the guiding force in selecting that name because that was the kind of person that he was. Alito, as a student, was remarkable. I remember we had a camp at one time and he was described as the shining light of the camp. I lost track of Alito for many years because I moved, I was traveling all over India. I lost track of him, but I got back to him in 2015. Strangely, he sought me out for a tot he needed advice for a totally different subject. I got back to Alito and Alito got back to me. And from 2015 till the time he died, I was particularly close to him. And when he did die, I was, uh, I was totally shocked. And I happened to mention to Suas that we need to get together and organize something where we could meet. I said, Alito was very close to me. And Suas turned back and he said, you're not the only person who's saying that. There are many people who felt that Alito was very close to them. So I'm very happy today to meet these people, even though it's online. People who have been very close to Alito, people who have shared the experiences with him. I was, to be frank, very close to him in the last few years because he would come. He was working with a group of, uh, of students from South Goa. So whenever he came down to South Goa, he would come and stay with me overnight, spend two, three days. So there were a lot of interaction, a lot of talk. And the day that he left to Bangalore for his operation, I happened to be there to say goodbye to him. And the thought that thing still struck me when he came out to drop me to the lift, he said, uh, Milan perhaps doesn't realize that I may not be coming back. Today I realized that he was telling me that, that he may not be coming back. But I feel that Alito has come back in so many ways. And one of the ways is the, the, the kind of people that I have met today, the kind of thoughts that have been expressed and the way that you've expressed it. And in my own humble way, as I consider a little my special friend, I would like to say thank you to all of you, to all the organizers. Organizers, I've met several of his students on several occasions with Alito, and I'm very happy with the kind of uh, production that they've come up with and the tribute that it pays to Alito. God bless you all. Education, which is a slow-moving 
a long term kind of process into the news columns of the newspaper which I used to write for very actively in those times. Is, is not an easy job, but Alito and me used to have a good laugh over it. Towards the much later on in life, uh, you know, I had, uh, I mean, he had the last laugh at me when I said something which he thought was extremely anti intellectual, anti theoretical. And I said, you know, you all academics and you all are just into building theories which may or may not have any relevance to real life and things like that. And he got quite infuriated with me actually. And he actually threatened, uh, we were sitting at some cafe together. He said, either this guy walks out or I walk out. And that's it. So I said, no, no, Alito, you please don't walk out. So that was that. But of course, we were great friends. So in spite of all that, uh, those are just my memories for whatever it was. And, uh, I hope, I hope that uh, after me getting down to this level, People like Advocate Albertina, uh, Professor Raphael, and Professor Pranav will say a few words. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rico. Uh, can we have some more people speaking? I'm sure many want to speak. What about the authors who want to speak? I think all of them have gone out, right? There are no authors. I have already spoken. Ah, uh, yes. Mozinia is here, but I guess she has spoken already. Yes. Yes, no. I have already spoken. Yeah. Kushbu is Kushbu. Are you there? Cheryl, Avita, yes, do you want to speak? Yes, Albertina, please uh, unmute and speak. Yes. Hi. Uh, I think it's uh, it's a long it's been a long meeting. So uh, I'll just briefly uh, talk about uh, what Vishal raised earlier, and uh, we've had long discussions on this about what privilege constitutes what constitutes privilege, because it's so normalized that we don't even understand that uh, we have that privilege. And I was. I mean, privileged in another sense to have these uh, detailed, uh, you know, long as like all of you have been talking these long discussions. Uh, like we would go for a meeting and then he dropped me and then there outside in my house, uh, you know, in the car itself, we'd have another one hour long discussion in the car, you know, which, uh, uh, on the whole uh, uh, on on many issues and especially um, towards the end we were discussing, in fact. Uh, we were together, uh, part of uh, a group called Social Justice Action Committee, um, which the late uh, Talman Pereira had initiated, um, and and we um, we, we uh, you, you know in in that uh, meeting also uh, he he brought up this thing that we, it is not for for those who happen to be privileged to talk about uh, you know the disadvantage. But rather, we should be talking about privilege and uh, and showing how it is being normalized. So that I thought was a, a, a important. And he actually discussed some cases with me because I was telling him, no, but that person, uh, you know, uh, that's not privilege. Uh, that person has uh, studied hard and uh, she was there on her own merit or whatever. And then he would actually break it down for me and, and show me how there was privilege involved in the in the backdrop. The other thing about um, was also about about how he uh, it was obviously not easy for him when he was in the university to bring up the whole issue of reservations in the university because he was part of the in that sense part of the establishment and uh, still I mean it, you know I understood how how difficult it must be I myself. Uh, you know, uh, understood the consequences of, uh, of uh, you know, raising uh, issues of reservations. Uh, and I understood how much difficult it must have been for him to do that in, in being in the university. 
Um, so that's what I wanted to say. There's a lot that, that I can say on and on, but these things I wanted to highlight. Okay, so um, anybody else would uh, like to talk? Uh, I am Suhar. Yes. Yeah, I would just like to pitch in again for the Kokni uh, translation. If all the authors who have written the articles are willing to write or uh, make a Kokni uh, version of it, I believe most of them can. One or two cannot, we can uh, get someone to translate along with them. And we can come out with the Kokni edition. Uh, actually, uh, actually, we were ha like uh, Sir Alito and uh, me had a discussion, but that time I think he was already uh, diagnosed with cancer. We were having a discussion about having the Kokni edition, and but then we couldn't figure out uh, in what dialect it would be and in what uh, script it would be. And yeah, so, so, so we when it, when, when it comes, sorry to interrupt you, uh, I think uh, that's a later question because. We can also have it in uh, Kokni Kannada, if it comes to that. We want the book to spread everywhere. Yeah. No, Patrick, that is fine. That is not an issue at all. What you I know, mean, so, so first, first the, let it come in Kokuni. Now, whether it's yeah, so or towards whatever, the end, towards the end, the uh, last thing that we spoke about was asking the authors to uh, write it in their own Kokuni and in their own dialect, and then see how it goes ahead. But then we couldn't put it into action because of his untimely death. Yeah, fine. And I'm sure most of them must have thought about this and then converted it to English, looking at the background and the way they have all spoken. Yes, yes. But now yeah, the so question is, like, I think the only hurdle would be time with the given, uh, you know, employment. They're all teaching and doing some work. So whether they all would have the time, energy, no, no. interest See, so to Fad do that, that. Can I interrupt? Yes. See, it's not just a question of time. It's also the willingness. If you have the willingness, you will find the time. If you say the time, you start with that, then uh, it is not going to happen. Then you get, then better find out a different method. Yes. Yes, like how Gasper said, we could have the discussion with the authors. It's their work, so let them also be a part of it. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, sure, because authors, they have to be willing, no doubt about that. Or if they are not willing, then we need to find some other way. Is that that or we have to find someone else who is capable enough to, uh, you know, <laughs> translate it? Dialect, actually that is, that is what I feel, that they should write in their own dialect. It's not that it has to be standard Kokni. Yes, I absolutely agree with you and even uh, there are certain things, that's my opinion, finally the publisher Dinesh also will, uh, or someone else who publishes will also have a say, but it can also be multilingual, like how Alitya is today. Some things they can say in English, some words or whatever. Yeah, yeah Mr. Sadikar, when we do some Portuguese 
books not see we need to get them back in the market but there's absolutely no relevance to it to today's goa so we put one para for each chapter in english you know mm. to tempt an audience into at least trying to see what is in the book mm. so that we definitely mm. ಹಾಯ್ Hi. Yeah, I'm good. Hi. Now the remaining three hours we spend in saying hi to each other. I'm really, I'm really I'm really grateful for all of you organizing this and uh Alito is all in our minds and uh he really deserves this. Uh thank you, thank you so very much. Favita, Rico, Elizabeth, Gaspar and all others. Thank you very much. uh am i audible am i audible yes yes, yes, yes. okay I, i was hesitant because i was not too sure of my device and network uh, uh my memories of ali to stretch back to 85 87 or so uh very briefly uh he was known for arguments i think all of us in different ways will say argue or discuss or whatever if you said uh, jack he would say jill if you said x he would say y and uh, at the end i mean those discussions would go on for quite some time i remember meeting him at the end of the working day and we would still be stuck in the corridor for another 30 45 minutes uh, end of it you were left wondering whether you know so much talk was really necessary but uh, you could still see that he had a different way of looking at things uh also because of the hassles he had with uh, university administration and rules i also was forced to go through ordinances and statutes and and uh, you know be a little more proficient in understanding statutes and ordinances and bureaucracy and so on uh one point that distinctly comes to my mind is uh, uh if i'm not mistaken alito was the first uh, faculty member to get a computer a personal computer in the university uh, in his cabin uh so he bought that but i believe a few months later he was actually given a show cause notice asking why he was keeping uh, uh, an electricity consuming device uh, in the <laughs> university uh chamber uh, in his chamber <laughs> and uh, you know it may look very uh, uh, surprising and uh, you know quite questionable now but that was the kind of attitude that existed then so you can imagine Uh, the kind of struggles he had uh, to put forward some of his ideas uh, and uh, have them implemented uh, uh, even open the concept of open book exams or changes in pedagogy and so on i remember that there were quite a few uh, discussions that took place uh, kind of in the corridors or in the canteen because alito came up with uh, very revolutionary ideas or challenging ideas and uh, then there were these after effects uh, ripples discussions and uh, uh, should open book exams be allowed or not a whole lot of these things uh, after he started the digital storytelling uh, project uh, uh, the one credit course uh, i think we saw the outcome of uh, so many students who produced their stories and uh, the impact that he had also he encouraged uh, two of the candidates to present their dissertations which then on them recognitions abroad uh he often had to challenge uh, uh, the administration and uh, the reservation uh, issue was one of those which uh, which shook up the university but i can see the benefits that uh, so many of the candidates now enjoy because alito at that time stood his ground and uh, took up very challenging position uh yeah you know, these are just snapshots of memories that i have of alito of course uh, whenever we met it was Uh, uh nice uh, i mean very cordial speaking to him and and learning from his perspective uh i'm sure all of us do have fond memories of him thank you yes mr uh, vernon would you like to speak 
Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. Hi. Um, so, I, I was feeling a bit shy to come and speak, but I think after hearing all these stories, uh, just wanted to uh, say a big thank you to everyone. Uh, I'm a bit of an outsider to this circle, I think, but uh, I'm actually married to one of Alito's niece. And uh, to me, I feel a great sense of loss because I didn't know him for too long. Uh, so having this has really helped me know the man. And uh, two things that have really stuck with me from today's meeting is firstly his, uh, his um, compassion towards his students and trying to get um, the education across to no matter who, right? So <laughs> something that I joke with my wife quite often and now with my parents is, you know, when I was in the third grade, they actually held me back. <laughs> and made me do another year because I was bad at, uh, I, my grades were bad compared to my peers and you know, my parents always compared me to my cousin. So yeah, the teachers and my parents thought, okay, this guy can't learn, so they kept me back. And uh, that has always stuck with me my whole life and it <laughs> took my parents immigrating to Canada for me to break out of that. Um, and today I have an engineering degree because I broke out of that social circle and uh, was able to teach myself in a way that I could learn. So that's one. And the second one is his uh, work on uh, reconciliation with, you know, uh, the tribes and things like that. Like living in Canada today, the big conversation that's happening here is about how the colonizer, uh, colonizers and Catholic Church um, tried to, you know, whitewash the indigenous people and um, a lot of the kids, indigenous kids were sent to these residential schools and a lot of them never made it back home and recently they've unearthed a lot of these bodies and things. So there's a lot of conversation about reconciliation and uh, while you all were talking about this, I'm like, thinking this is such a global topic it's not just you know portuguese and goans it's canadians and indigenous people as well and i hope that this propagates um, globally so thank you everyone thank you can we have a summit next Summit, you can unmute and speak. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, Hi, everyone. Summit. Hi. Well, well there we is so much you. to say. Yeah, there is so much to say, but I'm a bit mushy too, you know. I find I'm a bit overwhelmed by, um, by the full, uh, full meeting, you know, uh, hearing all the people saying all these things. And um, the role that he played in my life is so, I mean, is so transformative, you know, is, uh, I don't know even how to conceptualize it. It's, uh, has changed me into a man that I am today. You know? And um, very compassionate, I mean, though he was always, uh, uh, he showed affection towards people who are come from, come from disadvantaged sections of society. Uh, he never held it against uh, people who come from uh, what he termed as privilege, you know. And uh, for a person like me, who was like really coming from, from the uh, social setup that was privileged, but still, you know, marginalized or suffering or feeling inadequate in, in certain ways. He was... Uh, very open. He was very encouraging. He was uh, um, helpful in every possible way. And so it's like he was not sort of this ideological person, you know, who will be like, okay, so you come from this section of society, therefore you are not. Um, so he was very, uh, it's different, you know. Uh, his behavior was so unique and uh, so compassionate. I could almost see 
eventually as time passed i could see uh, sort of a very christian presence into him you know, very compassionate very uh, loving and helpful kind of personality so, it's a big loss i i'm still you know, what he called i still wish he was here i mean i, I almost felt like he left uh, just at the time when i could now argue with him you know i was like prepared uh, i'm coming back to india and now i'm going to argue with him and i'm you know I hopefully defeat him but he was gone and so it was like so upsetting for me i mean you know his, his death was very upsetting uh, it's like he left uh, uh, like he, if he was a boxer then he left the like game in between like i felt very disturbed and i wish he was here i really really wish he was here for some some more time thank you all i really loved listening to you all thank you thank you samit so much uh, and uh, thank you for everyone uh, who spoke their hearts out today it was so wonderful to hear so many close uh, close friends of professor and uh, his associates and uh, such a wonderful way that professor influenced and impacted so many people so many lives uh we really thank god for giving for have giving us uh, professor alito he's not with us here but uh i think we should take this forward to you know uh, better heights and uh, take this book forward uh, so with this uh, i thank everyone for coming here tonight and uh, uh yeah I think we'll end it here. Thank you so much. I also want to thank the team. Thank you so much, the whole team of Howcon. Thank you. Yeah I think everybody uh, please uh, you can put on your uh, cameras so that we can get a nice click and say cheese anyone with drinks anyone with drinks please raise your glasses cheers to the big man no they told you to raise your glasses anyone with drinks Please, please. Hi, Alexander. Lovely. Please. Cheers to the big man. <laughs> Cheers to the big man. Whatever it is, oh. the story lives on. Only Ali Jo could have put all of this together for this long. Thank you all. Have a good night. Alexander. Alexander. Thank you. Okay. Thank yes. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you everyone thank good you. night thank you thank you. Thank, you. thank you thank you professor thank thank you alexander and kyoko and visham yeah. okay yeah yeah sure okay bye, bye. yes bye. bye you thanks for everything Ready, opening up. I'll put up. Yeah, yeah. Come.